um, let's commence the rules and open government committee and committee of the whole for Wednesday, June 24th. Um, I believe this is our last meeting in the fiscal year. Is that right? That's correct. You dog. Whew. I'm too soon. Okay, so we'll uh, begin with uh, a roll call. Uh, I believe we have, I see Councilmember Davis, Vice Mayor Jones, Councilmember Camus, and Councilmember Reynas, are you there as well? I see you. Uh, yes, I am. You are great. Okay, we're all here. And we'll uh, start with a review of the agenda for June 30th. Um, given the large number of items that are both on there and apparently may be added through our actions today, I wanted to make a suggestion that we start closed session at 830 and Rick seems to believe that we'll move fairly quickly in closed session. Then we go straight to open session at 9 a.m. Does that work? Okay, Dave's nodding. So we'll go yes. that way until, until a motion says otherwise. Um, we've got a lot of ads. It's like support for ACA5. So I ask the maker of the motion to consider the ads, the ad sheet includes POA agreement. Um, is there that, anything that can be moved off the agenda? Is, does, do we need to take a position on ACA five, for example, that could take hours of discussion. I think it's, that's a good question. I think it's going to the ballot, isn't it in November? Um, yes, the Senate just passed uh, ACA 5 about a half an hour ago, um, and it had already cleared the assembly, so it will be on the November ballot. It is out of the legislature and does not need to be signed by the governor as it is a constitutional amendment. So we could postpone this till after our July break because it's already passed through the House and the Senate or the, the assembly in the Senate? I suppose we could take it up the first week of August. That would be one of the suggestions I would have. There's Better other count. things that we could push off to. Yeah. Um, I should remind you on August 4th, you're gonna have all of your city ballot measures as well. Yeah. To consider. Yeah, nothing's easy. Um, <laughs> but we'll be fresh. Yeah, we will, we'll be, we'll be rested. <laughs> Uh, I'm guessing all these ads, Dave, are items that absolutely have to be heard, huh? Uh, are the other ads that you have there? Uh, yeah, I'm just going through them now. Um, the distribution agreements. Yeah, yeah, plan. Yeah, but, yeah, I would say they're all um, time sensitive. Yep. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, Let's we, then go to we could we could even put ACA five in September because it since it's already passed and it's already going to be on the ballot it's just a a position whether we say yay or nay yeah okay so we can certainly the make a motion can certainly consider a deferral uh, of that item let's uh, let's begin on pages uh, five and six any changes pages seven and eight, part of our very lengthy consent calendar. Pages nine and 10. Pages 11 and 12. Pages 13 and 14. Pages 15 and 16. Seventeen and 18, okay. 
19 and 20. Twenty one and twenty two. Twenty three and twenty four. Five and twenty six, um, can I ask, uh, Dave? I see that twenty uh, eight point five is being pushed to the consent calendar. But there's there are provisions here, for example, proposing payment of up to $25,000 per tow operator. And I heard something, I haven't read this report yet, but I heard something about it coming from COVID funding. Um, actually, that is a pot, you know, it's not COVID directly, obviously some of the, we were able to get reimbursed for some of our COVID expenses that, uh, that well, actually, I think it is being identified as part of the business relief. Um, but let me just, the reason we've just, we decided to put it on consent, it can certainly stay on the regular agenda or be pulled off. Uh, I just know that we've got consensus with the tow company, so we're not expecting any opposition to the issue. Um, and so we're, we, were, we were scouring the agenda to see what we could either take off or put on to consent. So that's what we did. Okay. I, I'd prefer not to put that on consent because I'm, I'm concerned about the payment and trying to understand exactly why and whether we need to do that, but. I mean, I, yeah, I would say, you know, it's, it's all laid out in the staff report, but certainly if, if there's, um, you know, discussion is needed, we're, we're more than ready to have that discussion. A lot of work has gone into this. Um, okay. The dollar amount is pretty low. It, it certainly meets, meets our normal criteria for going on consent because of the dollar amount being so low. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, are there any other, wait a minute, let's uh, ask, see, we have one member of the public, Blair. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your uh, nine items today, Mayor, uh, policy ideas uh, that we can talk about with the changes with the SJPD. Uh, it's something we can all refer to now in the coming months and know how to work and navigate and I hope we can all be open to things. Uh, three items on the council uh, agenda I hope you can talk about more is uh, the smart wave technology. Uh, that's a technology company that's going to be using, uh, uh, you know, apps and tech in, in downtown and, and in, uh, in the east side school district areas with the new 4 and 5G. That's $1.5 million of tech. I mean, it's, gonna, it's a lot, and that involves IoT and other issues. You know, I hope you can really focus on public policy ideas and open public policy ideas. I mean, it, working around the school district with the new digital inclusion stuff, it's just vital to our future and what are good practices. And I think it's, it's, it's the long-term legacy of what San Jose can offer technology for the future. So I hope you can work on that issue. Uh, thank you for the IPA issue um, that you're going to be uh, investing in the IPA uh, right at this time. I hope uh, with, uh, you know, police, uh, the police union issues that you will take the time and effort to, um, we can go past the June 30th date. It's the same on your list, on your list of uh, nine items. You want to practice audit skills with the SJPD, we can be auditing uh, practices, why not do that with the SJPOA at this time as well and, and work past the June 30th date. And my final 14 seconds about the equity ideas, it's a godsend. You did great, except for one item. We need to talk about digital inclusion and what is the future of that. Uh, that, that shouldn't be a part of the equity policy. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, returning to the panel. Is there a motion? Motion to approve with the exclusion of that one item on ACA5 to be agendized in end of August or September, whenever staff can bring it back. All right, in the fall. Um, and uh, is that with an 8.30 start? And with I'm an 8.30 start time and for the closed session and uh, an open session to start immediately after closed session is finished. Okay, why don't we say at nine o'clock to give notice to the public? That'd be all right? Absolutely. Okay, great. Is there a second? I'll second and I have a question. Are we renumbering 8.5 to 2.23 or? Uh, I guess it, it doesn't really, probably doesn't matter. <laughs> um, Councilman Reyes? Uh, so let me understand the motion again. Uh, Council Member Camus, are you saying that uh, you're leaving it to staff to figure out when it's best suited to uh, take it to the council? And, you know, I'm not advocating for sooner than later. Um, I'm good if we can leave it up to administration to figure out when it, it you know, if it's August or September, whenever Absolutely. the yeah, whenever the staff, uh, exactly. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor? Well, I was going to actually, uh, Council Member Reyes, uh, disagree with you. I, actually, I was going to advocate for sooner rather than later, not necessarily June 30th, but uh, I would like to see this come up on uh, a future agenda in the not too distant future. So the earliest we can get it on the agenda and to have that discussion would be um, my preference. Okay. The earliest that staff wants to can bring it. How's that? Great. That works. Uh, Councilman Rennes? You know, I was just going to say that that also, I didn't see that I was going to have uh, another vote here um, that would be supportive of this. So I'm really uh, grateful for that, Vice Mayor. Yes, I'd love to see it. The sooner the better. Um, I think it's important for us to educate our community. This has the potential of dividing our, uh, our communities that are very um, prevalent here in San Jose. And so I wanna make sure that we have the kind of conversation that creates unity versus uh, divisiveness. So, so thank you, uh, Vice Mayor. I, I hope that they can find uh, the time that to, to bring it forward and so we can discuss it. Okay, and this is on affirmative action, is that right? Or on, um... Yes. See if I, okay, yeah, I've already endorsed it publicly. Okay, uh, on the motion then, wait, there was a motion from Councilman Camus, did that get seconded? Yes, I seconded yeah. it. Oh, thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Are you, are you opposed to the motion? All right, that passes. We are on to the public record. Motion to note and file. Second. Uh, Blair? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Uh, in the 100 ways that important ideas and changes to SJPD can be addressed at this time, uh, this is my all my public record letters smushed into one letter. Hope it can work well. Uh, as, uh, as we can address SJPD issues at this time as defund, demilitarize, reallocate, and reform, uh, these can often mean the same thing if we are friendly and open with each other. There can also be a countless number of issues that will need to be addressed this summer and in the next few years. As the city government of San Jose's study of equity the past few years can also simply help provide good decision-making and direction for a budget with COVID-19 related issues for the next few years as well. I hope we will have the patience and open mind uh, in how to address both small and large changes with the SJPD, city government and community in the next few years. There is a level of dialogue around the state and federal government at this time that can address rent forgiveness issues for both owners and tenants in open and positive terms. I feel that the current level of dialogue can keep people from all sides out of harm and danger. Its words and ideas are meant to help avoid rash and impatient decision making, help avoid confusion. It is up to ourselves to have open and good dialogue in the better ideals of the CARES Act and HEROES Act. Interestingly, this is how we can raise ourselves as a whole community effort towards our better human nature in obvious time of need. It looks like I may have to speak here often in the next few months and into the fall to help in the efforts to try to make clear the most, that most tenants and owners did not have a part in the planning of this pandemic. And from this, they should be allowed full debt forgiveness 
and not have to be stuck with any of its debt burden. Uh, thank you. Do I have any time left? Uh, I have 20 seconds, seconds left. Yes, sir. I have 20 seconds left. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm sorry about my first words uh, about the equity plan. I, I really want to discuss this fully and what changes can be made. It's a great start. There has to be a few changes. There has to be to give it the long-term uh, eternity, uh, eternal ideals of it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, back to the panel on the motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes. Hi, this is Tony. Hi, Tony. We have an, an ad that came in for section D under meeting schedules. Um, I'm gonna share my screen so you can see the memo. Okay. Um, and this is, we had so many agendas going on last week. We did not get the special city council agendas for the planning commission interviews onto this agenda. And we've also set a June 29th special meeting with the county. I do not have an agenda yet to review, but I wanted to note that for the record that we're setting that meeting. Um, to review the 26th and 29th special meeting agenda, it's basically the same meeting, just split um, over two days. You need to decide that, that we need to review those. And if you vote to add that to the agenda, then you can review the agenda. Okay. M so I guess I make a motion to add to the agenda. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Tony, can I ask, we, we're we having two meetings to select planning commissioners because we have so many. Yes, we have the five vacancies. It's the first time we've had this many vacancies. Um, and when we did the indications of interest, we ended up with 15 um, applicants that were selected to move forward. Wow. Okay, and we have to fill those vacancies before the end of the fiscal year? Yes, their terms end June 30th. All of them, okay. Yeah. Okay, uh, there's the motion. Uh, any questions? No, okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Is anyone opposed to that motion? All right, that passes. So that essentially will get on the calendar. And here's the one item on the agenda for you to review. It's the, the agenda is only one item, it's this. So yeah. this is your agenda review. Okay, that's it. Do we have to, do we have to approve the, the actual agenda item? Um, yes, you just approve it the way you did the, the June 30th agenda. Move approval. Second. Move agenda. Thank you. Uh, Tony, if, if I could ask a point of clarification then. Yeah. How does the agenda get approved for the joint meeting with the county? I don't think we can. I, I talked with the attorney's office and she said to just un say that we don't have the agenda yet, um, that we're setting the meeting. Right. The, um, council, the rules committee has to approve setting the special meeting or the meeting with the county. Okay. Uh, there will be an agenda and on orders of the day, the bodies will agree to the agenda item, will discuss the agenda item and determine what goes on the agenda if you don't have an agenda ahead of time. Thank you, Ed. Will, will, but will that agenda, will we have the ability to post that agenda before the meeting? You should post the agenda before the meeting. Right. The question is whether or not the Rules Committee can approve it, but since it's not available today, the Rules Committee cannot approve it. They can approve setting the meeting and then the agenda can be posted and on orders of the day is when the bodies will need to consider the items that are on the agenda. Got it, thanks. The agenda will have to be posted at least 24 hours before the special meeting. Okay, <clears throat> then first um, we have a motion from Councilmember Davis on the agenda of the Planning Commission item. Blair, I assume your comment is not on the agenda of the Planning Commission selection agenda. No, it is actually, it is. All right. Yeah, thank you for unmuting me. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to quickly <laughs> offer uh, in, in choosing a planning commission person, uh, you know, the future of Wi-Fi broadband and 5G, uh, many of its issues will go through planning, not all, but some. And for them to have a good awareness of, uh, you know, open accountable practices and open public policy ideas, you know, to start to gear planning commissioners towards that sort of thinking uh, is important. It's really, really important, Mayor. And uh, I just hope you can learn to, to offer that, uh, that kind of service to our community uh, in the future. Thank you. Thank you. 
All right, on the motion, uh, Councilmember Davis, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, that passes. Then is there a separate motion for a joint city county meeting uh, to be held on Monday morning at what time, Dave? 9.30. Motion to approve. That late, huh? Okay, 9.30. And, and generally the topic is, I'm assuming, it's COVID, COVID, COVID emergencies, right. And as I said, the agenda will have to be posted 24 hours before the special joint meeting um, so that the public is aware of the actual discussion. Of it. Okay. So it's going to be a heck of a week. <laughs> all right. Uh, any, uh, all right. Any comments? Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, enthusiastically, any opposed? All right, uh, off we go. Mayor, I have one question yeah. before we move on. Um, if the time is earlier than 930, uh, do we have to make any kind of provision for that? Like that we've approved 930 if they decide it needs to be earlier? Because it I would was have to be, you can decide on rules today. If it's earlier than 930, if the county would like to meet earlier than 930, you can, you can agree to that. Whatever is posted on the, the agenda will have to be the date that the time that you will start. You could not start earlier than the date posted on the agenda. I'm just concerned because I think they they may or may not all know that we have a special meeting that afternoon. Yeah. So I'm wondering if they will want to start it earlier. And if we have to if we have to have if we have to change our motion so that that can be worked out between now and then. Yeah, do you want to make that motion? Councilman Davis? Yeah. I'll, I'll, earlier. Yeah, I'll, I'll move that that special meeting can start earlier than 930 as staff, uh, at, at staff's discretion. How about that? Do you want to put a, 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 a no earlier than? <laughs> uh, <laughs> 5 a.m. What? 5 a.m. <laughs> I would say no earlier than 8 a.m. Okay, so between 9 and 9.30? Well, I said I said no earlier than 8 a.m. in case. Okay. You know, in case they want to start so, it. So you're giving the, um, authority to the city manager to uh, agendize it no earlier than 8 a.m. on Monday um, with the county then. Correct. Okay, um, and that was seconded, I believe. On that motion, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed to that motion? All right, that passes. Okay, we're back to the agenda. Um, G1 is the consent calendar. Move approval. Second. Blair, did you want to speak on the approval of the Parks and Recreation Month sponsored by District 8? I was uh, wanting the item on uh, Black Lives Matter. Okay. Uh, I'll come back to you then. Okay. Uh, on, the, on the motion on the consent, all in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Uh, that passes. Um, item two is Coronavirus Relief Fund Accountability. Uh, Joe, are you on the line? Uh, Mayor, this is Lee Wilcox. We actually Please. have uh, Joe Royce, Julia Cooper, and Luz Cofrese Howe and I are all here, and we do have some slides we wanted to walk through. Okay, great. So, yes, thank you for having us. Um, Luz, can you go to the next slide? So on uh, June 10th, uh, the, the Rules Committee um, report or uh, asked us to report back on how the city and the Emergency Operations Center would comply with the city's principles of transparency and accountability, uh, specifically related to the coronavirus relief funding and the $178 million that was received. As discussed on uh, June 10th, the Emergency Operations Center administration is taking several uh, steps to ensure that we meet all of the federal requirements with the coronavirus relief funds and the other funding sources 
um, that, um, that we've received as part of this response. Um, these steps include a mix of uh, internal checks and balances as well ex as external checks and balances and resources to help support this work. And I'll ask Luz to walk us through um, that work. Good morning, committee members. Luz Cafresi, Howe, Assistant Director of Finance. In front of you is the current sources of relief funds, which is on page two of the memo, that information memo that was provided to you today. Uh, current sources of relief funds. Current is becoming a, an extraordinarily flexible word for us. As you might appreciate, the sources of relief monies coming into the address, the COVID-19 pandemic, are changing almost on a daily basis. For example, there is now a round two of emergency solutions grant funds for 32.8 million that we just heard about that's coming to us in June. And that's CDBG money that comes out of HUD. Uh, the initial tranche for that much source of funds was 2.9 million. So that second round is over 12 times as much funding. And so that effort will be going towards uh, ho ho homeless and housing for the homeless. And so that's an extraordinary, once again, multiple of money that's coming to address those needs. There's also another grant for which fire and police have already applied to support COVID-19 related activities. That will net about 865,000 to be shared between the two departments. There's more detail in the memorandum about each of these funding sources. So I'll defer to that, unless there are any specific questions you'd like for me to address. And so, uh, once again, using the most flexible meaning of the word current, uh, this bar chart represents the most current allocation of the sources that were on the prior slide. This reflects the June 23rd, 2020 adoption of the 2021 operating budget. That's the action that you took yesterday and gave the administration specific direction on how to spend all these monies within the many federal guardrails that we're getting. Uh, in considering how to address the concerns expressed in the June 10th memo and demonstrate the various steps the finance and recovery branches and the administration have already taken and will be taken with the assistance, support, and guidance of the city manager, the city auditor, the city attorney, as well as several various uh, external resources, we've pre-prepared what you see before you. It's called a RACI matrix. And a RACI matrix is a responsibility assignment chart that maps out every ta task, milestone, or key decision involved in completing a project and assigns which roles are responsible for each action item, which personnel are accountable and where appropriate who needs to be consulted or informed. And this is all about the key goal of transparency and accountability. The project in this case that we're looking at is a comprehensive management of the COVID-19 disaster cost recovery process with the overarching goal of maximum reimbursement of COVID-19 related expenditures all within the guidelines of transparency and accountability. This iteration of the RACI chart demonstrates the broad areas that are being addressed or will need to be addressed in the COVID-19 disaster cost recovery process. So starting at the top with the funding sources and strategy bubble, the city will need to strategically manage multiple funding sources, all with various and never got ever changing guidelines. For example, there was an update to, as I mentioned, there was an update to the coronavirus relief funds FAQs issued just today. Uh, the city will need to remain current and knowledgeable about, about all these incoming resources and then apply them judiciously to the wide variety of needs being identified by the council, the city manager, the EOC and our residents. Once these sources are identified, we may need to chase them. In the, in, the, in the case of applying for funds such as the US commerce monies that we haven't even talked about in this presentation, but that are available on, on a competitive basis and manage them well. The risk mitigation bubble at the bottom comes into play when we focus on key risks, such as potential duplication of benefits, potentially in spending on ineligible expenditures or not following the federal procurement guidelines to access goods and services. And last but not least, it's compliance and performance auditing, which happens after we have successfully completed all the other tasks. And this is the eye chart that I provided on page eight of the document, which lays out who will be responsible, accountable, consulted, and informed about tasks. As you can see on the left side are the various tasks and processes to be completed with the teams involved across the top. So for example, if you go down to the transparency and accountability portal, 
And that portal is going to be uh, demonstrating things as cumulative spending on uh, by vendor, by grant, by program area, by location. And so the mayor and the city council would be consulted on what that looks like. The city manager would be the accountable one. They would designate the sources and the resources for that and make sure that the product, the final product is a quality product. The finance and recovery branches would be responsible for actually implementing that task. Budget would be consulted as well, as well as the city manager, Widow O'Brien, LLC, and Ernst and & Young. And to provide you a little more detail on what additional resources we're adding to, to uh, help us with this, as, as was mentioned in the memo, a Byzantine task, we already have on board Macias Guinea O'Connell, LLP. They are our financial and they provide, do our financial and single audit. They've been with us since February of 2018, so they've already performed audits for us. They're a well-known organization. Right now they have become a national organization. And they will be helping us if you go down to the very last line, the federal single audit, they'll be responsible for that. That contract is managed by Joe Royce out of the city auditor's office. We've also engaged with Widow Brian LLC. They've already helped us with um, expedited FEMA applications, provided us some very excellent uh, guidance with public health, uh, some situational awareness as far as uh, the return to work process. And then we are having uh, entering into negotiations with Ernst & Young LLP. This was the organization that I obliquely referred to last week. And we are, they will be providing us additional in, information and assistance in all these particular activities. And with that, I'm going to stop talking and defer to the council for any questions or concerns. Thank you, Luce. Okay. Uh, to members of the community, uh, Moto G. I swear you just pick on me when I have a mouthful of food. Um, I just want to make sure that these funds are well spent and well thought out and don't end up in debacles that hurt people like the trailers. Um, I just want to keep driving those trailers home. Um, I also want to make sure that um, advocates are brought to the table that all. Uh... Okay, you've muted yourself apparently. Could you unmute yourself? They're being included in decisions uh, with unhoused people. And I think that they are an essential part of this, an essential bridge between the decision-making process and unhoused people. I think that we can actually help a lot in how folks are being treated. And I think that that would be a good thing. So please include us in this process. I think that we are left out far too often. Thank you. Uh, Blair? Hi, I just wanted to thank, uh, you know, yesterday learning, learning, you know, the situation with the trailers was, was important to me. It helped me figure things out a lot. So thank you for the dialogue on the trailer situation yesterday at public meeting. On this item, uh, the same thing, you know, mm -hmm. I just, I, I'm hoping just that, uh, we can have we can work towards openness and open practices and and for to have an open mind you know to 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 see choices and possibilities i mean there's really good possibilities that we can work towards and i think it has i you know it's going to be an important point of mine uh at this time you know what we do here at the local level you know we we can really develop the ideas of peace and long-term peace. And, and those are the types of things we bring to the table with other countries uh, in the future. And it's those good practices that can prevent our future from being as violent and screwed up as it currently is. And so, uh, you know, I, if, if it's a de dedication to, to good practices at this time that uh, I wish everybody good luck in talking about and working on together. And like I always said, uh, you know, back in mid-March, uh, you know, the ideas of equity can be a part of uh, the, uh, I got 40 seconds here. The ideas of equity can be a part of the budget process. And I, I think there, most people can derive a certain enjoyment in, in finding what that can be, what equity ideas within the budget can be. 
And uh, that's an interesting concept. And it's the same concept with my public policy ideas. There's enjoyment for most everyone once they see the ideas of open public policy. We just have to learn to have the security and the comfort and, and, and the wherewithal within ourselves to want to work for those good efforts. And once we do, we feel good about ourselves. And, and that's how we address the world in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, back to the panel. Questions or comments? Councilmember Davis? Um, I, I was going to defer to Councilmember Camus since he was the um, on the on the original memo, but I'm I'm comfortable with the info memo that we we just got. I don't know that this needs to come back to council. It sounds like uh, what the memo was requesting has is already occurring. So I, I'm I'm comfortable just having this be an info memo that goes to the goes to the full council. So I just wanted to put that out there. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Councilmember Camus. I agree as well. I really want to thank the staff. I want I want to I'm, I'm reassured that uh, we're doing things in a way that we're going to get the re results that we're that we're hoping for and the accountability that we're hoping for. I'm I'm also in agreement and I don't know I I don't know about the other co-signer of the, of the memos if they wanted to say anything, but I'm comfortable with where uh, where it's at, and I'd, I'd be happy to have an info memo sent to council uh, to that effect. Okay, uh, I I don't see that uh, other council members to see this was Councilmember Jimenez and Councilmember Sparza. I don't see. Uh, oh, I see, uh, Michael Pierce. Thank you, Mayor and uh, committee members. Uh, Michael Pierce here from Councilmember Sparza's office. Uh, unfortunately, Councilmember Sparza is under the weather and couldn't be here today. Uh, but my understanding is that, uh, yeah, this is, uh, you know, uh, the council member is, is on board with this as well. We were really just looking to get a sense of the processes that were going to be in place to ensure accountability. Um, and we appreciate uh, staff's work in bringing this back to the Rules Committee. Okay, well, I suggest then we move on to the next item. Um, thank you very much, Luce, for the presentation. And thank you, everyone, Lee, and everyone that's been working hard, Jim on, and, and Julia on all this. Uh, let's go on then to uh, number three, which is Rent Relief Through CARES Act Emergency Solutions Grant Funding. <clears throat> um, there, is, uh, there are a few members of the public who would like to speak, uh, Anil. Thank you, Mayor, and, and, and the... Uh, Anil, we're having a hard time hearing you. Committee, you know, our member has been struggling with uh, misread payments and how they're going to go proceed with maintaining their buildings as, and, mean, and, and paying their mortgage as, as uh, this pandemic continues and, and, and tenants uh, are still unable to pay their rent. We wanted to make sure that um, any rent relief that is uh, proposed be uh, cover a number of areas. One, that the rent relief be directed uh, to the property owner, that the rent relief be available for uh, use of uh, back pay of this rent, and that it be directed to the, and it be only available to those who are impacted by COVID. I think these will just really focus the uh, aid where it's needed and uh, bring the relief to those who really need it. So thank you. Thanks, Anil, and good luck managing there at home. <laughs> uh, Blair? Hi, uh, thank you. Blair Beekman, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, I guess to, uh, you know, with the same words as a uh, part of my public record, uh, and you know, what, what I've been trying to speak in the public record for a month now. Um, you know, this is an issue that I, I really don't feel is the fault of owners and tenants. And there is an etiquette to the practices of capitalism and the society we live in that is not allowing a better, more open discussion to happen that, you know, owners and tenants shouldn't be really liable. And we're all having kind of a secret, lazy conversation about it. And tenants are getting away with things. Owners are getting uptight about that subject. I just hope we can really open up and clear the air that, you know, there has to be a way to everyone can be relieved. And we shouldn't have to be, 
uh, owing debt. Uh, I just find it appalling that we have to. And uh, this, the, if this COVID was a socially planned thing, to leave everyday people responsible for that is appalling. And so I really think there has to be answers by our state and federal government that you can much, very much help facilitate. You know, what can be carrying good practices at the local level so we don't have mass, you know, uh, displacement and, and those sort of issues. And it's just, um, I just, I just hope it's, it's frightening. We don't want to say the words, but we just have to practice how can there be full rental forgiveness ideas. And, and I suppose in those terms, that's how you have to construct certain rules and patterns, but we keep constructing these rules and patterns that we can't even talk about the subject. And that's hurtful to me. And I just hope we can all make those efforts to make this a real open process, because this is a, a very serious emergency. It has a very serious need and uh, it should take precedence. Thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey. Uh, Mayor and Council, uh, good afternoon. Um, so I think we're, we're typically used to being disappointed from what emerges from Washington uh, in terms of its impact on our city. I think with these ESG dollars, we're really lucky in that uh, the city has received a larger uh, than at first, uh, I think many of us thought we would be receiving in terms of this round two of ESG. Uh, and why are we receiving more money? Because of the particular high levels of rent burden, because of the particular high levels of overcrowding in our city, uh, for all these reasons, we've received more money, and I think now we got to make the most of the opportunity when we think about what do we need to do with rent relief. I, I support the, the memo from Councilmember Esparza and would and appreciate the work that the Housing Department uh, has done on looking at rent relief to date. I look forward to Council hopefully having this discussion about how do we make the best use of these dollars, uh, focusing on hopefully yes the the rent arrears. Uh, we have you know likely. Uh, tens of thousands of families that have uh, multiple thousands of dollars of rent arrears at, in this moment and trying to figure out how do we prioritize with this you know, significant amount of money. It, it won't solve the entirety of the problem, but it could really make a difference for thousands of families. And so how do we focus on those neighborhoods that are most impacted by COVID right now? How do we focus on those individuals that are left out? Of, of the kind of federal income replacement programs, uh, UI and PUA, uh, really thinking about that. And also being thoughtful that we have two different eviction problems. We have the rent arrears problem of folks who've been laid off uh, and uh, don't have access to federal programs or have been slow to get on federal programs. But we should also be mindful that after July, if the federal government doesn't renew the FPUC, that $600 a week additional payment, uh, we could see an additional kind of second wave of, of folks at risk of evictions. And so trying to be thoughtful about how to design a program. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, coming back to the panel. Um, Dave, I understand this is going to take some time. Is that right? Yes. Um, thank you, Mayor. And, and I know Jackie's on the, the line. I think, um, I think Jackie can help explain kind of how we would factor this into our thinking and really the process uh, that needs to be involved for uh, the expenditure uh, and the, uh, approving the expenditure plan and, and when we would bring that to the council, which I think is in August timeframe. But Jackie, you want to fill in the gaps there? Yes, thank you. I'm Jackie morales Ferrand, and I'm the director of housing. We have two concerns regarding this request at this time. It's both a process concern regarding how CDBG, well, actually how all of our HUD funds are allocated. And it's also, as it turns out, a policy concern. So the first issue in, promise, uh, in terms of process is um, we have a citizen participation plan that we're required to follow uh, anytime we program federal funds. And so uh, this, this, this funding needs to go through that process of which we anticipate will occur in early August, late July or early August. Um, and so the public has to be given a certain amount of notice and it has to be given notice in a certain way uh, in order to be part of that participation plan. And it's, we're usually planning all of the dollars. And the second issue, as it turns out, could be a policy concern. We just had a call with our HUD technical assistance people. And as it turns out, uh, one of the things that HUD is very concerned about in terms of the use of these funds is using it to actually create uh, housing opportunities for homeless people. 
And the city with the $32 million has received $56 million of of funding that we have redirected all towards COVID, of which originally none of it was being planned to be used for permanent housing or getting people into a permanent solution. So after hearing HUD's request that we need to have a strategy that includes uh, funding for permanent housing, we, we need to uh, rethink what the plan will include. So, um, we do have a, a citizens participation plan we need to follow and we do need to address this policy issue. And we have also heard that HUD is very concerned about putting too much money into homeless prevention, again, without putting funding into other areas, uh, specifically towards creating housing opportunities for people. Thanks, Jackie. Uh, with regard to HUD concerns, is the concern ultimately about a clawback? They have to approve our plan. So wow. after the council um, approves our plan, we submit it and then HUD has to approve it as well before we can actually spend the funding. Got it. Okay. And when they express concerns about permanent housing, does, for example, if we had funding to support transitional housing, does that align with what they're talking about when they say permanent housing? It's not housing? permanent housing. So it would be actual units. Yes, yeah, so they're thinking rapid rehousing. Where we're actually getting somebody into a permanent placement um, okay. and resolving their homelessness. And so I think part of the concern will be that we've redirected so much of our money into short-term solutions or interim solutions for, and for obvious reasons, because we have done a lot on the permanent side. And this has been a first time that we've had the opportunity to do as much on the short-term side. But I think that without balancing some of these solutions with a permanent one, we may run into HUD not approving our plan. Okay. So it means some portion of this may have to be dedicated to an ongoing a permanent site that maybe needs some, some gap funding. Is that, is that probably right? Okay. Uh, so you nod your head. And then, and then finally, Jackie, um, are these subjected to the same restrictions of other CARES Act dollars has to be spent by December 30th, has to be spent within the city of San Jose for San Jose residents, that kind of thing? Yes, it does have to be spent, uh, has to benefit the city of San Jose, um, and it has to be spent within two years. So we originally had, uh, had created a plan that was looking at providing additional assistance for operating our interim housing in our BHCs, right. because you know we need longer term operating dollars. Um, and we also have been working with the EOC on an encampment response program that would be a very supportive program in order to address, since we know we can't house everyone, we wanted to do an enhanced services program for our encampment residents that included outreach, hygiene, which includes trash service, and then housing placement as well. And then finally, we were looking to see if we could allocate some money for homeless prevention because, you know, the system itself is very limited in terms of its ability to absorb our funding. As the apartment association said, are we giving the money to tenants? Or are we giving it to landlords? Our funding requires we give it to landlords. And so we have to have the right infrastructure in place for somebody to actually uh, get that money through the system. So I can tell you, I had $10 million of home money and uh, I just wanna thank uh, Council Member Arenas who encouraged me to reach out to as many agencies as possible because only one agency was able to absorb half of that money, but because we did more work, we got another 4 million allocated, but we didn't get the full 10 million worth of takers who are willing to write checks to landlords um, because that is a much more involved process. We have to verify income. We have to verify they have a lease. We have to verify the payment goes to the landlord. So there are some more requirements that come with this money and not everyone is willing to, to actually distribute it the way uh, the federal government requires. So Jack, you're saying the money can't just be put in the pot that's being managed by Destination Home and Sacred Heart. Uh, and 
Correct. We actually did not, we're not recommending in the home program that any of us going to destination home, but we are having uh, it go to Sacred Heart is agreed to take 4 million of it. Okay, and that's for direct payment to landlords only. Direct payment to landlords. Okay, I uh, don't pretend to know what's involved in dealing with federal <laughs> strings, but I'm glad you guys know what it takes. Uh, Councilor McCamus. Thank you, Mayor and Jackie, you've already, um... Uh, answered one of my questions. So uh, I think uh, council member Esparza wants to discuss this thing in a, in a city council meeting. And I think October, is, is that when this is coming back? No, we're bringing it back in August. August. In August, okay. And so this memo, I mean, uh, I think that this memo would probably be better presented at that meeting where you're presenting you know what you're going to spend the money on right now you have not decided that this is new money correct this is the round two correct this is new funding that uh, it's part of the original cares act but hud created a new formula and so we were just uh, notified of the amount okay and so um she i think she's asking for 50 percent of the money to be spent in one way or the other but but uh are, you just said that there's some restrictions on this. Uh, are you going to come back with a spending plan in August, or um, or are we allowed to dis to tell you how to spend the money, or do or does that money come with strings on how so, you spend it? So we typically, we typically come to the council with a spending plan, um, and then there are times. Uh, in fact, the last time we came to council, uh, we did make an adjustment to the plan. And so we're coming back for a new revision. So you don't necessarily always just rubber stamp our the staff recommendation, uh, but typically we create the plan and then um, you formally accept it or reject it or modify. Okay, so so I mean I I think I think that this memo is basically giving you direction, and I don't think we should be giving you direction as yet. And so I, I won't make a motion to approve it. I, I don't necessarily disagree with the directions that she's espoused, you know, but I would like for your department to come to us with, with what you think is best and then let us decide if we agree or not, right? <laughs> I think that's the usual way it works. Uh, and I'm hoping I'm understanding the, the memo correctly. Yeah, perhaps I could just suggest, I, I think clearly the expenditure plan is coming back, so they don't need direction for that. Uh, I could just suggest that this would be then put on that August agenda when it does come back, so that way the council can consider Councilor Esparza's recommendation in totality of what, what the staff has recommended. Thank, uh, thank you for articulating that better than I did. Uh, that's, pop, that's pretty much what I was trying to say. Can't this memo go on that date? Okay. Councilman Rennes? Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I have a question, Jackie. Um, I know that you're gonna have to go through the citizen participation uh, process to develop a plan. Could that uh, process guide you um, in, in, in terms of how you break this, this money up and the purposes for this money? Or is HUD telling you that there needs to be a certain percentage that goes to um, permanent housing? development and um, homeless prevention. I didn't hear a, a, a percentage and I wasn't sure if you were gonna base it on what you hear from the community. So that's a really good question. We have not, so I, today was the first I heard that there was an expectation that we have some investments in permanent housing and that there was any kind of concern around homeless prevention. So we've asked or some technical assistance. And that's why really we're not prepared today to also make any decisions. And we have some policy work we still need to do to determine where this direction is coming from HUD and exactly what it is and how they will evaluate our plan. So I literally, I just heard about it today mm -hmm. and we are working with, um, like I said, some technical assistance people to figure out what mm -hmm. exactly that direction is. Um, so. Uh, that, that's one factor, right? So whatever HUD tells you, we will do because that's, you know, they give us the money. But the second uh, factor is what it sounds like what the citizen particip 
participation process develops for you, right? And that will also help guide you. Is that what I what I'm understanding? Yeah. From that? And also, we also plan to be going to the lived experience uh, board, uh, which is a group of formerly homeless or currently homeless people, to get some of their feedback. And we're also required uh, to coordinate with our COC, which is the county. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Okay. It would be interesting to find out, you know, of course, for you, I'm sure you're on the edge of your seat trying to figure out what those percentages that HUD is thinking about in terms of homeless prevention. As you heard from some of the speakers, they know, and you know this, we all know this, that the bubble is going to burst real soon in terms of um, paying some of those rents. And, uh, and some of those amounts are not going to be feasible. And so people are going to be losing their, their, their apartments, their homes, um, creating a, a bigger uh, problem for us. And I'm sure that HUD already realizes this. Um, and I don't know if they're going to change their strategy um, because uh, I think in most large cities, there are moratoriums like this that are preventing the bubble from getting burst, right? Correct. And I think the issue with HUD is that it was explained to me today was that uh -huh. there are homeless people on the streets now. And Got what it. are we doing to get them sure. into housing? So, I mean, sure. it's true. We're putting one person into housing and another person's becoming homeless. Right. And they're saying that too many communities are spending their money because homeless prevention tends to be an easier approach. Uh, on the prevention side versus ESG is all about addressing homelessness and people who are homeless. And so there is a concern that the funding, which is supposed to go for homeless people, is being mm -hmm. diverted to actually people who are housed. Sure. Sure. Well, you know, I know that you'll make the best recommendation possible for, for us. You'll bring that forward. I think that the only point that I just want to emphasize is that, you know, uh, I don't know how many times I, I agree with Daniel Babar from <laughs> Real, uh, Real Estate Association, um, but we're on the same side here in terms of, you know, they recognize, we recognize that this bubble is going to burst. I know you do too. And so as, you know, I know that you've been working really hard in trying to make this work in every which way. I hope that we can build the capacity of more providers to do uh, more homeless prevention because it, it, I don't know that it's easy. It doesn't sound like it is, um, especially with, I think, with what we've discussed in terms of capacity for uh, one organization when we lean on them uh, uh, for too much and these funds are limited to direct dollars for rent and not for the um, administration or overhead. Um, and so they have to come up with their own dollars uh, to have additional people um, provide some of these uh, stipends or some of the work that needs to get done. So the last question I just had for you was, uh, were you able to, to um, have Catholic charities online with this or is that something that, that they were open to? Yes, yeah, so Catholic Charities is one of the entities that agreed to take on some of our home funds. So we're bringing forward next week an action that is going to provide an additional eight to nine million dollars in homeless prevention. And I would say the city of San Jose is probably the largest uh, investor of homeless prevention and rental assistance funding in the county. So we're exceeding what anyone else has given by you know, investing close to $30 million in homeless prevention and rental assistance funding. Yeah. All right, well, uh, I look forward to that report you said in August that you'll uh, bring it in. I'm guessing your process to engage people will happen in July. Wonderful, please let me know if there's anything that I can um, uh, put out into our social media um, to invite folks. Um, uh, I don't know if it's very targeted, and if it is, you know, I'm, I'm sure that you have already your folks identified or the the avenue that you usually would go to to get those folks um, and their feedback. But uh, thank you for all your work. I know that it's been quite a bit. I don't know how you keep it all together, um, but we we're all coming to July uh, very soon, and so hopefully you'll you'll be able to rest a little bit more. Uh, thank you. That's it. Thank you. Uh... Michael Pierce. Thank you. Um, again, Michael Pierce uh, on behalf of uh, Council Member Esparza today. Um, you know, I 
we we certainly understand the the restrictions that we're that we're working under, and um, you know we we know that that this uh, information from HUD is uh, is new. Um, I think the you know the the intention of bringing forward this proposal is really to bring attention to the really really dire need that we're seeing in in so many of our communities, and as as others have mentioned, we know that we're looking at that you know, at that <laughs> additional bubble that, that's going to be bursting when things like the the uh, expanded uh, unemployment run out, um, assuming they don't get extended. Um, and so our council member Esparza's concern is that, you know, the, the need is so great. Uh, and if we don't, you know, if we don't act and we don't act quickly, um, we're we're just going to see so many families uh, facing facing crises, um, you know. Again, to kind of throw out some of the what we included in the memo, uh, you know, we know that the um, the interest list for the the destination home and Sacred Heart uh, partnership, uh, I think in the memo it's twenty one thousand. I believe as of last week that had grown to twenty three thousand families, and we know that that is. Uh, you know, nowhere near the full scope of, of need. Um, and so again, we, you know, certainly understand the, the constraints that we're working under with this, um, but we really want to highlight that, you know, the, so many of our families uh, are going to lose their homes if we don't act quickly. Um, so just wanted to, wanted to really emphasize that. Thank you. Councilman Kimmins? Uh, sorry, sorry, I had my hand up still. I, um, it was in regards to this item, so. Okay. All right, uh, then is the panel uh, open to uh, a motion to, to push this onto the council calendar for August? So moved. Second. All right, motion second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Um, item number four is resolution, resolution proclaiming Black Lives Matter. Uh, Vice Mayor. Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor. So um, all of us individually have expressed our support for Black Lives Matter, but uh, as a city, as a collective, as a community, uh, that voice hasn't been heard yet. And so I wanted to make sure that we pass a re resolution that uh, really makes a statement in terms of not only what we're saying, but also what we're doing. So I want to make a motion to approve my resolution. Second. Okay, thank you. Um, Blair? Hi, can you hear me? Hi, yes. Hi, thank you for this resolution. Uh, you know, Black Lives Matter can be, to me, to myself, an all-encompassing term. It can apply to many people and many situations in our lives. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, thank you for, for this item. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, we're learning to talk about the ideas of equity, which are really important this, at this time. And I'm hoping that the ideas of equity, you know, I used really bad language before, but I'm trying to understand the words of what can be eternal about the about the term equity in the same way that we respect our constitution and our declaration of independence those are eternal words and for the ideas of equity to be about human rights and civil rights and possibly even workers rights you know to make those uh, eternal issues are important to myself and um so i, I have questions uh, that i'll raise in in, in the uh, open forum but I, I just I just hope that that we keep that in mind that we're raising important issues uh, with equity at this time and meaningful issues and I and I that I hope can be open to dialogue how that can always be refined and uh, better talked about. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Moto G. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say like if this is just. Um, saying something and paying lip service. First of all, I just want to thank Chappie for doing this. I think that's awesome. But if it just turns out to be lip service, I don't think it's okay. We need to remind ourselves that the vast majority of people who are going to fall into homelessness 
if we don't give them rent relief are people who are people of color. We need to remember that the majority of our unhoused population already are people of color. Um, and I just also wanted to uh, maybe offer a friendly amendment uh, from the peanut gallery. Uh, it would be great if we could join other big cities and paint Black Lives Matter down Santa Clara. Um, I know I've asked about that and been told that they were afraid that there would be car accidents from people trying to read that. That sounds like the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Um, but it would be great if we could do something like that. Additionally, it would be great if we also painted Unhoused Lives Matter, since we're the city, you know, one of the biggest cities with one of the highest death rates. Uh, so it'd be great if we could paint that down, maybe San Fernando. Um, but I hope that this doesn't just turn out to be something that we proclaim and we don't back it up by preventing more homeless people, that we don't get the current unhoused people like housed, that we don't actually recognize ways to address the racism in our police force, that we don't, pro, uh, and in other areas of our county and our city. So I really appreciate Chappie for bringing this up because if we don't talk about it, we can't address it. So we need to address this in all ways. And that means getting rid of Chief Garcia. That means getting rid of racism in our police force, making sure that uh, we stop having such high numbers of people of color in our unhoused population, on the edge of becoming homeless, et cetera, et cetera. And I hope that Chappie uh, accepts my friendly amendment. Thank you. All right, back to the panel. Councilman Rez. I don't know if I can second from the peanut gallery, <laughs> but that sounds like a, a, a wonderful recommendation. Um, in all seriousness, I just wanted to thank you, Vice Mayor, for, for putting this forward. I think it's it's very specific that we speak about the Black Lives Movement, the uh, Black Lives Matter movement. Um, as I know that uh, the Black Lives Matter movement is uh, an agenda that is inclusive of immigrants, it's inclusive of LGBTQ, it's inclusive of underserved, it's inclusive of working class families. And so I know that it's very representative. It's not um, uh, to exclude any other lives, but it really is um, uh, to establish uh, uh, that, that um, this community actually matters to the rest of us. And so I'm glad that you brought this forward. Um, I think it aligns and, and uh, uh, really nicely with what we're doing in equity um, because Black Lives Movement uh, leads with race and absolutely leads with race. And so our equity uh, framework also must lead with race because that's what it's meant to do as well. And so I think that we're just uh, aligned very well to receive a Black Lives uh, Matter movement um, it into it very nicely into what we're doing and how we represent our cities. And so thank you so much for, for bringing that forward. Thank you. All right, on the motion, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, that's unanimous. Thank you. Uh, then we'll next take up item six, which is the Greater Downtown San Jose Economic Recovery Initiative. Um, Councilman Peralta, you appear to be on the line. Would you like to speak? Yeah, uh, and I believe there's some uh, community members and maybe uh, participants of the task force that wanted to speak. So if they go, uh, go to the public first, yeah, thanks. Okay, sure. Uh, Blair? Hi, um, for this item, I'm sorry, I did not quite uh, read the memo well enough, but I, 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 there is always comfort in the downtown area. <laughs> and I thank you for that. Uh, yeah, I hope that can that can be continued in whatever uh, endeavors you'll be going through. Um, I guess you know I've been trying to make clear you know my ideas about uh, the geofencing and the uh, smart street lights, uh, you know the time street light timers. You know those are issues uh, that you know of, of IoT, and it, I guess we're at the time to start asking, you know, how I, IoT can be is going to be more part of our lives, and to develop, you know, good open public policy, you know, that can be easily understandable for the downtown public, you know, so they can look up stuff, refer to stuff, and then ask you guys questions and talk to you. 
you know, I hope that's the future we're working towards. And it doesn't have to be scary, fearful, or uptight. You know, I mean, we've been working really hard to, to get ourselves out of the mind frame of being at war and that everything is secretive and you can't ask any questions. And, you know, I'm, I'm really upset that this COVID-19 has happened and has thrown kind of a monkey wrench into the things or just a wrench. I don't, I'll just say a wrench into the things. And, you know, we can, of course, modify ourselves and, and make a beautiful future, you know, but I think we're determined that beautiful future is one of peace and we, and we plan our social, life, our social planning needs in the future that doesn't have to harm each other more. And that has to need a good local government that you can trust and respect and ask them questions and they can answer you easily. And it doesn't have to be a competition and which is what San Jose often does. And I just hope we're learning those important lessons about openness. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Nate, welcome. Hello, Mayor, good afternoon. Hello, council members. I'm actually not a member of the task force, just so we're all on the same page, but many, uh, one of my colleagues and many of our members were, and um, I'm here today to recommend that the memo moves forward in its totality and uh, just a couple of points to support that position. Um, at the San Jose Downtown Association where I work, I'm the business development manager. Um, we really felt that this task force process had great representation across a bunch of different small business types. This um, COVID-19 pandemic and the effects of the shelter in place have often been thought of only in terms of um, hospitality businesses or talked about mainly in terms of hospitality businesses and the sharp decline in business that they've seen, but arts groups, nonprofits, um, I don't know what you call aesthetic workers, people who cut hair and do nails are have often needed a voice and a seat at this table as well. So we commend uh, Council Member Perales and David Tran, who did a ton of important work on this for making sure that um, the right types of businesses came to the table. We feel that these are reasonable common sense recommendations that align with some movement already happening in terms of changes to the parking program, the Alfresco program that so many on the staff are working so hard to get moved and improved and open to more people and um, SJDA's own internal uh, recovery campaign for marketing and getting ready to welcome people back to downtown. Um, so once again, thanks everyone for the hard work and we just like to ask that the memo be moved forward in its totality. Thank you. Thank you. The person with the phone number ending 970. <laughs> uh, thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor, City Council. This is Brendan Rossin with San Jose Jazz. Um, and first of all, I just wanted to thank yourself and the council for the support last week with the city budget uh, in the supporting the, um, the arts organizations, the cultural arts grants program. Uh, it, that was a, a, a big deal for all of us who are continuing to try and keep, keep working uh, in, the, in the downtown. Many of, many of the arts organizations are uh, adapting to new ways to connect with community and, and that support is greatly appreciated. I had just wanted to, I was a member of, of the um, Arts and Special Events uh, Committee, co-chaired that with WISA from uh, San Jose Tyco, and we'd just like to uh, recommend and, and uh, support that this memo moves forward uh, to the full council for a discussion. Uh, the process was, I, I thought was exceptional. It put many of us um, that hadn't, we, we worked um, somewhat together, but for the first time across different downtown small business sectors that had the opportunity to really look at the interrelationship between all of us and and see the opportunities to, to work together to build a, a better downtown. Uh, and a lot of good thinking went into this um, uh, into this effort and I'm very encouraged about where it could still go forward from here. So uh, hopefully you will continue to, to support it and um, thank you for um, hearing me out. Thank you. Right. Takahiro, welcome. Hi, um, yeah, I was actually the co-chair for the personal care committee. Um, I had actually, uh, thanks for uh, hearing me out. Um, a huge thank you to council member Perales for organizing this. I think what we've done here, um, you know, with his vision is uh, really reached out to a lot of uh, small businesses, business owners all over downtown, especially uh, people of color, um, businesses owned by people of color. And we've essentially handed you a recommendation list um, on a silver platter. Like we've done all the discussions, we put a lot of hours into this. And I think it's really important seeing, I think we're seeing like counties and cities close to us that are just opening with no plan and without any input. And I think this is a chance for San Jose to really move forward. 
safely and strongly. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Wisa, welcome. Hello, Mayor and fellow council members in the Rules Committee. Thank you for hearing us out. My name is Wisa Uemura. I'm Executive Director for San Jose Taiko, and I was um, honored to serve as co-chair of the Arts and Special Events Committee, as well as co-chair of the overall task force. Um, it's I really hope um, that this committee recommends this, this go forward um, in totality. It was a group effort. Um, many thanks to Council Member Perales's office um, and himself for putting this process together. It While no process can be completely inclusive, we really tried to hear a diverse spectrum of voices and cross sector. Um, I was really, what is the word I'm looking for? I, it gave me hope in this these very difficult times that organizations, small businesses could come together and look across the room or the virtual room and, and really deal with each other in respect, even though our perspectives were different, our needs were different. Um, but we do think that this package that we put together of policies is representative of the food and beverage committee, the personal care committee, general retail, and of course, arts and special events. Um, we're really looking we're really hopeful that you guys will hear us out and um, seriously consider these recommendations. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, Laura, welcome. Laura, it appears you're still on mute. Could you unmute your device? There you Sorry, go. Mayor. Hello, Mayor and Council. You missed the first half, so I'll speak quickly as usual. I'm VP of Marketing for Team San Jose. Very honored to be a part of this. Want to thank Council Member Perales and all the staff at D3. It was um, an incredible opportunity to be an at large part of this conversation and hear not only what our small businesses need, but how some of our bigger businesses might be able to help. Um, so I thank you for listening and um, I thank Council Member Perales for allowing Team San Jose to be a part of it. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Uh, hi, Chris. Welcome. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, I'm Chris Patterson Simmons, and I was honored to be part of the Greater Downtown San Jose Economic Task Force. Thank you for Raul Perales for creating this. And I totally agree with the recommendations with Wissa, Taki, and Brenda. And Brendan, I'm sorry, I was one of the co chairs for the um, General Retail and Services Committee. I'm so really praying that these recommendations be heard. It's very necessary to have a task force that was created in such a short period of time. Um, a lot of dialogue was, was created and I was able to actually see our city in a different light that I appreciate even more so. I'm really proud of our city. I'm excited. Um, I know that everybody that's on this panel cares about what's going on. Um, we, we gotta just move in a whole different direction and that doesn't have to be a negative thing either. Um, I embrace everything that's coming. And I know because of everybody that's on the council and the people that I've met within City Hall, we're gonna be good and I appreciate it. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Chris. I know several of the folks, including Chris who just spoke were on the committee and I wanna thank them and we're co-chairs of, of various committees as well. And, so I want to thank them all for their participation and engagement. It seems like there was a great group. I uh, really appreciate everybody rolling up their sleeves at a time when it is so brutally difficult and you're just trying to keep the wheels on in your own in your own small business, your own organization. So appreciate your generosity of spirit uh, in, in helping uh, to figure out how we're going to do this moving together. I've, I've had a chance to review the recommendations. I think there are many very good recommendations. Um, I, I would point out a lot of them are just about really getting the city out of the way in many ways and, and enabling businesses to be able to to be creative in this very difficult time to be able to, to thrive and survive and, and to get outdoors. And, and those are all things I think uh, this council can embrace. There, there was one recommendation around a marketing campaign, number four, and I just would suggest, I think there's some very creative people I know who have just spoken and others who haven't, who are deeply involved in marketing every day for their businesses and their creative organizations. And I think people obviously like Scott Neese and, and others downtown association. And uh, we've got great uh, agencies like liquid agency, for example. And, and um, 
I guess what I would say is I, I think the city should be a partner in this, but I'm not sure the city should be driving it. And I would really try to invite uh, the many creative people in the downtown to put this kind of thing together. And the city certainly can be doing all it can to leverage its resources to get those messages out. But I think those messages probably are often best from, from the, the business and, and small organization community anyway. Uh, anyway, Raul, thank you for all the work you've uh, put in this and, and your uh, leadership in this effort. That's my Yeah, thank you, uh, Mayor, and thank you to uh, all the, the speakers that participated uh, today. And I just wanted to give a, uh, a personal shout out to uh, the task force members, some of them that you heard from, Brendan Rawson from San Jose Jazz, Wisa Uemura from San Jose Tyco. Uh, Fernanda Carrera from Adega and Pasteleria Adega, Cash Boren from Haberdasher, uh, April G from the Petite Galleria, uh, Chris Patterson Simmons from New to You in the Urban Kiosk, uh, Megan Caravazos from Wesca Gym, uh, Taki Kitamura from State of Grace Tattoo, and then our at large members uh, who you heard from Laura uh, from Team San Jose and our very own Blage from the city of San Jose. And um, just to before I get into the comments, I'll say, Mayor. And in fact, on that recommendation for there already is a a good collaborative effort going on, in uh, in regards to partnership with the downtown association and Team San Jose. I think that this came out of the group as a very important um, recommendation, something that they wanted to see be uh, a united front in a collaborative effort. Um, and I think we have some of the wheels rolling on that already. And I don't think um, the group itself even was interested in, in just say this, the city of San Jose may be owning the marketing there. Because uh, again, and that's partly why we, we asked someone like Laura to be a part of the group, because we know that the, the resources they were already working to try to achieve um, in, in regards to, to helping to promote the brand of San Jose and, and specifically in and around the downtown core. Uh, so I agree with you there. Uh, I think that it was it was uh, extremely important for the group though to to present that as well, um, and and just want to um, you know be able to, to to voice a little bit of of what we went through and and hopefully earn support for this moving forward and then getting council support ultimately next uh, Tuesday. And so uh, you know we we certainly I think um, have seen what's happened and the impact to all of our community, uh, but we did a, a specific survey through this group um, with the greater downtown businesses and found that 60% of them reported a loss of 50% um, or more. And 32% of businesses reported a 90% loss. Um, and 32% uh, also had reduced anywhere between one and 10 employees on their payroll. Uh, and as you can imagine as small businesses, sometimes this was uh, nearly their entire workforce. Uh, and so certainly our, our small business community through this pandemic, uh, what we initially heard was an interest for, for them to be a part of the conversation and to have their voices heard. Uh, the first actual um, action that, that was taken was uh, a, a letter uh, between uh, three different uh, coalitions, also including uh, the mayor's task force and uh, sending that to the county board of supervisors. This is really the second action from this downtown San Jose Economic Recovery Task Force. And um, so in hearing that need from a lot of our small businesses, um, we, we acted as quickly as possible to try to pull together uh, a, a structure and a format to allow them to have their voices be a part of the conversation, at least here within the city as, as best as we could, and then use that platform uh, to ensure that we could uh, inject uh, the ideas and their voices into the county and this, even at the state level. So we had over 40 small businesses and local organizations that came together to form the Greater Downtown San Jose Economic Recovery Task Force. It's a, certainly a mouthful, a bit of a long name, but we, uh, we went through a process with uh, the task force members to one, identify the geographic area, which is um, not just the downtown core, but certainly branching out to some of the areas, which is why we called it Greater Downtown. Um, and, and so it's, um, you know, I think it was important for us to, to ensure that it really was community led uh, and led by these small businesses. And so that's where we developed um, as well, the mission of the task force, um, which I'll read off, which is to inclusively put forth solutions that will safely revitalize the greater downtown San Jose area by supporting the recovery of businesses and community organizations while fostering interest and confidence in public life in a COVID-19 impacted world. 
Um, you can see that online. We have a, a, a website um, through the District uh, 3 office. Uh, we have a, a, a tab, a separate page for this uh, task force where it, it, it lists that off. It actually has a link to uh, video recordings of all the task force meetings that we had. Um, and, and it'll have all the details there as well, uh, including the letter that, that was submitted by the task force that we have attached to the memo today. Uh, we branched out to um, the Japantown area, the Santa Clara, Alum Rock, and even along the Alameda. Um, and it was, uh, it was also inspiring for, for myself and, and my office um, to see the, the partnership. And after five weeks and uh, over 30 meetings of both the committees and the at-large, uh, we have this uh, list that, that the group themselves came up with. And uh, there are nine different recommendations. Uh, those are attached uh, in lieu of sort of being respectful of, of time. Um, I won't dive into each of them unless my colleagues are uh, interested or, ha or have any questions as the mayor did in regards to say recommendation four. Uh, but what we're asking is that you support uh, moving all of them forward uh, if there are indeed um, some, you know, I think redirection on where they uh, should end up, like uh, the mayor's comments, uh, I think we can be able to determine that um, as we move forward. But we're hoping that you can support all nine of these recommendations uh, to be agendized for next Tuesday um, during our COVID-19 report out. And I want to thank uh, everybody who participated uh, in the task force, uh, those that certainly uh, speaking up uh, for your needs, your own needs during these uncertain times and the value that you create for uh, our downtown and our greater downtown area. Uh, thank you and I'll be available for questions. All right, thank you, uh, Council Member Perales. Um, I just wanna say that uh, I wanna commend you and your task force for uh, the recommendations. I had a chance to go through them and uh, I think they're really strong very well thought out and uh, your task force did a really sound job in terms of moving forward some policy recommendations that I think are going to make a difference in the viability of our businesses downtown. In fact, your recommendations are so good that I think we should take that show on the road and expand that throughout the city because I think there's recommendations that are applicable not just for downtown but for all businesses throughout San Jose. So great job. And so I will make a motion to move the memo and the recommendations forward to council. So Vice Second. Mayor, if I yes. could ask a question. Sure. The way that the council member um, framed the recommendation, it wouldn't allow the council to take any action. That's, um, that's correct. Yeah. So I think, I think if, if you're looking for the council to take action, this would probably need to be agendized separately from my report out. Um, so I just want to put that out to uh, the rules committee. Sounds like Rick is reinforcing. Yeah, it can it can be uh, it should be separately agendized if you're ask, asking the council to adopt the recommendations or any number of the recommendations. Uh, okay. It can be heard with 3.1, and you can put that to be heard with 3.1, but um, it it should be a separate agenda item. I will modify my motion to make it a separate agenda item. If Thank you. All right, with second. second. All right. All right, Council Member Davis. Thank you. Um, I also want to thank Council Member Perales. I think this is a really comprehensive document, and I agree with Vice Mayor Jones that a lot of these are um, will help our businesses citywide, and I, I really appreciate that. I did want to ask Dave if you so the the direction on Council Member Perales's memo is to come back on June thirtieth, and I'm wondering some of these look like. Would staff basically there are a lot of recommendations here, and would staff be um, able to comment and report on all of these, the potential for all of these on June thirtieth, and then come back to us with anything we would need to adopt on at the beginning of August? Because it a lot of these look like a lot of staff work. Yeah, thank you, um, Council Member. So I, I think we can provide some some uh, feedback on some of them. You know, I think we've, we've been green lighting everything COVID. So it, in okay. essence, it, it just goes forward. It comes into us and we do our best. Now yeah. we may need to loop back. We need to make, maybe need to break some of these apart and, and come back at different times with, you know, further uh, analysis or input on them. 
but I think at this point we're fine just taking it as a whole um, and then factoring that in and then coming back to the council at, as uh, when we're ready on, on individual items. Okay. That's great. I'm glad to hear that. I, I do want to move as, I want to be clear. I want to move as quickly as possible on these, on these items. And I feel like um, when, when we passed al fresco, it was, it was um, just before the, the announcement came out that things could open up and we weren't, we weren't ready with, with all of that. And so now we're, you know, almost three weeks past when restaurants could do outdoor dining. And I can't speak for downtown because I haven't been down there during dining hours, but in, um, in parts of my district, we have people who already had patios um, or had, have their own parking spaces have, have been able to do that, but we haven't been able to kind of go out on the street yet. And we're still kind of trying to work that out. It feels like it's going a lot slower than it could. And it's certainly going a lot slower than it should for us to save as many businesses as possible. So that's why I'm asking, because I wanna be really clear about, um, I, I would like to know on Tuesday when we discuss this, what staff is willing to prioritize and how fast they can get things ready and whether they would need us to come back anytime in July to give them further direction so that as we get, and I'm, I'm being hopeful in saying this, as we get further direction from the county on what can be reopened, that we're, we're ready and we have already communicated with businesses what they can do to, to be ready for whatever we have allowed them to be able to do and whatever the county has allowed them to be able to do. Is that, does that make sense? Because it's a, it's a lot and I'm asking if, if it needs to be chunked out, how we can, how we can help with that prioritization so that, and there's a great point in here, so that the businesses that have been most severely impacted can be, can get back up and running as soon as possible. And we can already have all of our barriers removed when they get the okay. Yeah, thanks council member. So, you know, I, I think, um, you know, what you're looking for is, is, is the right thing. <laughs> I, you know, uh, will we be able to on Tuesday completely support that entire discussion? I'm not sure, you know, around prioritizing all of these. I think we'll be able to provide some insight uh, on the items and on what is kind of easier to maybe move forward with and what's going to take more work and effort. You know, how we prioritize everything. I, I know we're all kind of searching for that. We have so much kind of just in the, uh, the realm of our recovery efforts and our reopening efforts. Um, so I think we're, we're gonna need to figure out how do we really tee that up, that conversation up for the council in terms of um, a, a meaningful discussion around prioritization because we're, we're certainly at the point where we have way more to do than we can possibly do. Yes, and I, I totally understand that and, and it, Again, I want to go back to, you know, we had we had passed El Fresco, but the the policy work had not been completed. And and we didn't know any timeline. And we're it sounds like we're not going to know any timeline from the county on when when announcements will be made about what comes next, you know, other than having four days to prepare. So I feel like as much as we can get teed up you know, as soon as possible on the, the likely. And this is something that I hope will be discussed. I know this is not on this item, but we don't have an agenda for Monday. And I hope that the, the, the pacing, if it's not the pacing, but at least the, the sequence of openings could be shared with us and could be determined, that would help with your staff prioritization. And it would help us with our communications with our businesses, because I know. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt. But I just, I'd be happy if you want to hit rewind on that and, and play it again on Monday. I can tell you, I have conveyed that very same sentiment about eight or nine times <laughs> to yeah. the, the conversations that Dave has been a part of. So I do yeah. think that's really important. I, I could tell you it's, I think, I don't think Dave's going to disagree. I'm guessing we, we just need to get that. And I think that's a good conversation for Monday. 
I, I totally agree. And I have already relayed that, um, as you, as you know, I have already relayed that to both, uh, to, to Dr. Cody, to Dr. Smith, as well as to, um, to supervisor president Chavez. So, um, I, I have, and, and I do hope that we can all be pushing in that same direction on Monday because it is so, is good. It is going to be so important for, for our businesses. Agreed. Thank Agreed. you. And, and their employees. Yes, uh, not not to mention, of course. Yeah, uh, Councilman Pros. Yeah, thank you, uh, and thank you for uh, Rick and Dave the redirection to ensure that this actually gets its own agenda item. I appreciate that, um, and uh, just wanted to point out as well for staff, uh, we did ask the task force to go through the difficult um, decisions of prioritizing the items themselves. So they are in a priority order. Not to say certainly that right that um, they don't want to see number nine not get any attention, but the reality is is that we recognize this could be a, a robust amount of work. And so you can look at this list and recognize number one as the the, the one that this task force said was the highest priority. Uh, and I think if you look through the list, you'll see that they did a great job prioritizing it as well to kind of see, hey, number one is something to the vice mayor's point and uh, Councilmember Davis's point. It doesn't have to just be utilized in the downtown core, right? That's something that we can utilize across the city for uh, our, our businesses. Um, and then just I, I neglected to say thank you to my team. Uh, David Tran's name was mentioned. I definitely want to thank him. Uh, but this was a full team effort. This was not something that we had right planned ourselves. We learned how to host Zoom webinars uh, and pull together. Uh, quite an effort. It took a full team effort. So I just wanted to uh, say thank you to uh, to my team for that. Thank you for that clarification, by the way, about the priorities. Okay. Uh, so is there a motion already? Forgive me. I came in late. There is. Great. All right. Let's vote on that motion. That is to agendize it for next week. Yes. Okay. We've got a busy week next week. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. We're moving on then. Thank you. Um, Councilmember Pearls, don't go far. We've got a motion, a memo on item seven, improvements to public engagement process at city council, council committees and other city meetings. Uh, would you like to introduce this item? Yeah, um, and I think there may be some public comment on this one as well. So I'll defer to that first and then I'll jump in if you don't mind. Okay. Uh, Blair. Hi, thank you. Um, in my initial readings of, of this list, uh, thank you. It sounds like uh, some good, good beginning recommendations, which, you know, I think you're doing, you know, this month. Uh, thank you. I think that's all we can ask for as a community and as city government. I hope you can learn to take these ideas from the, and what community can offer yourselves, you know, from your good beginnings and and expand upon them and really build, you know, really good stuff out of it. And that way, we've got our community process and a really good community process and uh, that will keep everybody happy <laughs> and satisfied and and just uh peaceful and that's the ideas of peace and that's how we create uh, and continue you know sustainable democracy so so good luck in these efforts thank you uh for these efforts um my own personal complaints are about uh i'm a bit worried about the the brown act requirements that state that uh uh you don't have to allow people to speak at open forum of subjects that were spoken about during the meeting itself. Um, I wish we didn't have to take that so literally, especially at a time like this. People are new to the process. I hope you can, uh, you know, for the next month or two or three, give people a, a, a bit of a break and a bit, a bit of slack. There is, you know, the Brown Act does allow the ideas of the of the council and board people to to have discretion in in how to use the Brown Act. And I hope that you can simply allow people to speak at open forum a bit more and, and learn what the uh, give and take can be with that. Uh, thank you. And um, for 20 seconds, uh, I, what I mentioned yesterday, uh, you're allowing yourselves 15 minutes as, as council people to speak. I hope maybe you can, if you, you need an additional five minutes, to, uh, you can have five minute blocks uh, through a motion process after 15 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Mary Helen Doherty. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, uh, good afternoon, Mayor and uh, members of council. My name is Mary Helen Doherty and I'm a resident of District 3. Uh, first, I want to thank you for your action at yesterday's city council meeting for your approval of $3.4 million to provide 
11,000 Wi-Fi hotspots in support of the academic success of our students in our traditionally underserved communities. Yesterday's action has the added benefit of supporting residents who are struggling to have their voices heard at virtual city council meetings as more households gain access to Wi-Fi hotspots. However, additional changes are needed to facilitate equitable, equitable access to the work of the city. The recommendations for improvements in the public engagement processes enumerated in Council Member Perales's request will greatly enhance the virtual meeting experience and many will broaden participation in future in-person meetings. We believe you share the goal of ensuring all of our communities can effectively participate in San Jose public meetings and request your support to forward council member Perales's request for discussion at an upcoming city council meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Jean, welcome. Good afternoon, council. This is Jean Cohen. I'm here in a few capacities. First, I'd like to refer to a letter that's in your packet signed by almost 20 community leaders. Um, as a senior fellow with the American Leadership Forum, um, there's been conversations with our urbanist network about how civic engagement can be improved in general. And we thought this was a good opportunity to support Council Member Perales' recommendations. Um, we know that you share the goal of ensuring that our communities can effectively participate at City of San Jose meetings. And during this time when so many desire to engage in the democratic process and advocate for public policy, we must reduce barriers to participation. There's also a letter in your packet from UA Local Union 393. And we have 3,000 construction workers working in Santa Clara County. And as you make decisions about job site safety and public health, it's more important than ever that they're able to engage in that conversation. So for all of those reasons, we request that you support the memo from Council Member Perales. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Alex Car Caraballo, welcome. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Rules Committee. My name is Alex Caraballo. I'm the political director of IBEW Local 332 here in San Jose. Um, I'm joined today's Zoom call to show support for Council Member Perales. Uh, these improvements will make it easier to participate in the public process, which uh, are important to the members of my union. The City Council makes very important decisions on a weekly basis that impacts working families. The less complicated the process is for the public to engage, the more opportunity we have to hear from the the more opportunity the city has to be able to hear from our community. Thank you for supporting the recommendations uh, in Council Member Perales' memo, and I appreciate your time this afternoon. Thank you. Maria Fernandez, welcome. Hi, good afternoon. This is Maria Noel Fernandez um, with Working Partnerships USA and Silicon Valley Rising. And I'll be brief. Um, we are uh, here to support the leadership and the proposal by council member Perales. Um, as we've seen hundreds of folks trying to engage in the debate at the city of San Jose, I think we can all absolutely agree that we need to be doing everything possible to make civic engagement uh, really work for the majority of us um, in this new moment and time that we're all living in. And so I appreciate the work that's already been to date and um, urge the mayor and um, the entire rules committee to support this and move this forward and ensure that all of our community can truly engage in our democratic process. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Moto G, welcome. Hi, I think one thing that's being left out of the conversation, um, as usual, is unhoused folks. Um, we still need a place where they can access these meetings because they can't sit there, you know, for six hours, eight hours, sometimes 12 hours, um, sitting there in their tent when they still have a hard time finding places to be able to charge their phones and we still haven't gotten adequate chargers out to those tents. So if somebody can, you know, find a way, some place, a room that they can be in at, you know, where they find services that they can sit six feet apart and be able to like add their voices to these conversations that are so frequently about them, 
um, that would be great. It would be great if they could be included in these conversations. Because it's very to hear their voices in these conversations. Thank you. Uh, Dominic, welcome. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Can you hear me OK? Yes. Uh, Mayor Council, uh, Deers Rules Committee, my name is Dominic Toriano. I'm re representative with Local Union Sheet Metal Workers 104. I'm speaking in support of the recommendations by Council Members Jimenez and Jones. For over a year, thousands of voters and many Council Members in San Jose have supported the fair election initiative, which will increase voter participation by aligning the mayor's interest with uh, my mayor's election with presidential years and limiting campaign contributions from special interests. The recommendations before you today will help us achieve our shared goals of increasing the number and diversity of voters who participate in selecting our city's mayor. Uh, Dominic, no I think you're, I'm sorry, you wanted to speak on a different item? This is just, this is on the memorandum regarding the public. Oh, sorry, my, my, my bad. No problem. That'll come up, uh, I think, uh, in just two items more. Sorry, it's been a long meeting, I know. Um, okay, coming back, uh, Council Member Perales. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you to the public speakers on this, uh, the support from the American Leadership Forum group. Um, and, you know, I, I think um, certainly not trying to point blame at anybody here. We have all tried to adapt to uh, this this now uh, new process of Zoom meetings and uh, live stream and people being able to call in. Um, and what I've seen over the last several meetings and really last uh, several weeks is just a reoccurrence of things that I think that we can try and shore up um, to allow for greater participation, uh, more clarity. I think we've seen a lot of new participants as well. And I think that the ability to participate remotely from home uh, invites more people to, to be able to participate that maybe wouldn't have uh, done so before. And unfortunately, they're not as aware of uh, um, you know, how the process might work, um, you know, when items are coming up or how to, what, what they can speak on or not. Um, I would agree with actually, you know, uh, two of the comments that were stated, Blair mentioning, hey, um, you know, as we get to the end of an item and, and, and we're at open forum, um, certainly I think a lot of the speakers that we heard from the other week uh, were not aware that, uh, you know, how the, the sort of the open forum works. Um, and, and I actually would agree with uh, Blair's sentiment of, of sort of uh, being a bit flexible at times in that regard. And more importantly, what we have in the, the memo is to be just clear, right, to, to, to ensure that we have the clarity as much as possible. Um, and then I am also willing to, to ask that the um, maker of the motion, if somebody's willing to move this forward, um, actually amend number seven, which, does, which actually does talk about uh, issues regarding housing um, and, and COVID policies being agendized for the evening session. Um, if somebody would be willing to, to include in there um, for staff to, uh, to be able to come back to us with suggestions on how we can get greater participation from our unhoused community. Um, I, I would be willing to accept that and hopefully somebody can uh, make the motion. Thank you. Thank you. Motion um, to approve. This is a motion from Councilman Arenas. Um, so Dave, I, I wanted to uh, ask, I know that several of these is directed to you, but I think some of these items probably go to uh, the city clerk and some of these items I think are actually to me. <laughs> um, Rick, did, did you want to jump in? No, okay. Um, so I guess uh, first for Tony, you know, with regard to items one through four, obviously item two is something for me to consider, but items one, three, and four is there any reason why that needs to go to council? Could could you simply implement those? Yeah, we could. The first one on visually display the agenda item number or in title on Zoom, Zoom can't do it. We're already doing it on all the other broadcasts. I see. So we're kind of looking at what, what could we do to visually display it? Um, maybe a, one of the camera screens focus where it has the title. So as it cycles through people's camera, um, I'm not sure. Um, so right now, Zoom isn't allowing us to put a header on. Yeah. Um, for three, the closed captions, the current our current closed caption vendor is a person. 
Um, but we're going to automatic captions in July, so we can then link those auto captions to Zoom. So we can start the captioning, um, we can start captioning on Zoom in August. Okay. We can't do that for June because the July is when the switch is happening. Um, but as far as providing visual directions, I've already started working on that of how to like do like a little video plus maybe like I'm, I'm not a video watcher. I don't like to watch instructions on videos. I'd prefer like written pictures. So I'm working on a couple of things for that. And then four, I'm already typing the motion and the a spreadsheet with the votes. So when I call your votes, I'll just share that screen. So that number four is super easy. I'm already doing it. Okay, so so four we can implement. Three will come in August. Is that right? Yes. And then um, one is uh, we've got a challenge technologically. Yes. Okay. And um, I, on that specific item, either Councilmember Perales or Dave, if you guys have anything to say about how we might solve that, happy to hear it now. If not, we'll we'll keep going through this. No. Okay. Um, number two. Uh, I'm happy to adopt as a matter of practice. Um, so I think that turns our, our focus to items five through seven. Uh, item five is something that will take some resources, I'm guessing. Uh, Dave, do, do you want to offer any thoughts about that? Yeah, and I also wanted to just check in with Tony on, on five as well. Um, have, have you been looking at that piece of it, Tony? Yes, so for the Zoom translation feature, that's actually enabled, but we need to um, get a certain, what we can, what Zoom does what is it'll connect you to a translator. So we need to, um, and we've I've already contacted some interpreting services. So Zoom, if somebody clicks translate, it'll connect them to a live person who does interpreting. So I'm, we've enabled the Zoom feature, but we don't have the interpreter lined up yet. Um, hopefully I'll have something by August. Um, as far as the like 5C, the meeting agenda and packet information translate as a standard practice. I have an estimate for translating the agendas. It's about $4,800 per meeting to translate into both languages. And it's a six to 10 day turnaround. Um, they're still working on a, a, a proposal on a, the full packet. The full packet uh, can be about 800 to 1,000 pages. So I don't know if we'll be able to get that turned around in time, but we are working on an estimate for 5C. Okay, so this is something that will take some time, I assume, for you guys to sort out, figure out costs and what's feasible and what's not. Is that fair? Yes. Okay. So, Councilman Pross, do you have any problem with that coming back to us in, in August? Trying to, sorry, no, I, I don't. And I had raised my hand just because I had a comment on uh, item number one. If you want to be, I can speak sure. to that now. Okay, yeah, let's go back to one now. So I've actually personally been trying to get a hold of um, some of the, the team members over at Zoom because, as uh, we all know, it's headquartered just uh, down the street. So um, I think it may be uh, something that if, if it's an issue with Zoom itself, uh, Mayor, you might have a, a, a better opportunity of getting a, a response. I, I have a meeting coming up in about six weeks, so it's a little late. Um, I know they're busy down there too, but um, if it's a technological issue, I would at least like to see if staff or even Mayor, if you could use your leverage to, to see if we can't get them to, to find a way to help us uh, include that. Okay. Henry on our team just uh, indicated he has an idea. Is that right? Yeah. So Tony and I can work on, on those in regards to number one, though not. To this issue that he's raising. Oh, it's not on one. Okay, all right. Uh, so uh, understood. So we'll uh, we'll try to see if there is a solution there. Uh, so that leaves six and seven. Um, let me just say six. I assume again that's direction to me. Uh, so I'm chairing the meetings. Let me offer this. There are three occasions which I think this has been some kind of issue. On two of those three occasions we were dealing with people who were calling back in or signing back in with different names um, who had the intent to utter racist and you know, offer various expletives as soon as they got on. And so when we saw that pattern coming up again and again, um, twice I cut off the public comment because it became obvious this was just gonna encourage more of the racist and 
uh, kind of uh, awful behavior. And I, I simply cut it off. Um, and I, I took that as chair's prerogative and, and talk, checked in with Rick and he indicated that was fine. We'd already by that point exhausted several hours of public comment. And we were at the very end of all the folks who had indicated they wanted to comment. Um, on one occasion where that was not the case, I'd actually indicate on three times, three times that we were closing public comment, we were uh, very challenged on timing. Uh, each time I pushed the time back to allow more folks to comment and we were simply getting uh, we were simply getting squeezed. So again, you know, I, I, I try to check in with Rick to make sure we're not doing anything that is violative of uh, our, our, pub, our, our, our obligations um, to encourage and invite public comment. But I should say, you know, it is very often the case, and I was just talking to mayor in LA about this, about a lot of other cities simply say, we got 30 minutes for public comment. So we'll take the first 20 people to talk and that's it, you know, and everybody else just doesn't talk. And so we have, had, we have a very uh, liberal approach to public comment and that's a good thing. We want the public to participate, but I, I think we do have to appreciate we've been mightily challenged in staying on schedule enough just to get our work done. That is the, the work of the public done at a time that's reasonable, which the council has done. <laughs> Um, and so there are times when I simply have to say, okay, <laughs> we have we have announced several times this is this is closing, and we're still we're still getting stretched, and we're having a hard time getting finished. Rick, did, you look like you wanted to jump in there. Did you? Yeah, I just wanted to confirm that you know you do have the ability to and the flexibility to, in the case of the abusive comments, obviously that's something you can shut down. Um, I mean, the Brown Act allows and requires you to listen to people making criticisms of staff and uh, officials, but not not in a way that's necessarily abusive or disparaging. Um, and so there are rules of conduct that you, just on every agenda, decorum, and uh, and then as as chair, you're you're, you're certainly uh, and this applies to committee chairs too, entitled to uh, uh, set time limits. Okay. So I just wanted to share that the point is well taken and I'm happy to do more to try to ensure people are aware, Councilmember Perales, but I just want you to understand sort of what we're dealing with on our end. Um, yeah, and, and look, I've, I've appreciated your ability to navigate some of the really, you know, rude and racist comments uh, that have come in. Uh, there was one other time actually that I, I was also referencing, which I think was an open session item where we had uh, a community member even request, hey, could we can we wait off about 30 seconds or a minute because there were people that the close or the open session came rather quickly, I guess, at, at that moment. Um, and I felt that, you know, waiting 30 seconds or a minute wasn't going to going to harm any of us to see if there was other uh, public comments if somebody had mentioned that. Uh, I, I do agree. It's, it's difficult. I saw a couple people that uh, missed out an opportunity to speak when there were people sort of hijacking the meeting, just calling back repeatedly. Um, and so I don't, I don't, you know, don't challenge how you have to manage that. This was an attempt, uh, I think, for an ability just to ensure that uh, technological issues weren't the barrier, um, and and recognizing it's your discretion um, to be able to to accept that. And I think you you get sort of the the spirit of what we're going for on that. Yeah, so again, happy to uh, adopt the spirit of this, which is making sure there's adequate time after naming the person who's last in the speaker queue uh, before cutting off public debate or public comment. Um, uh, the, number seven, uh, obviously, is really, I think, for this committee um, about how we want to agendize items. And I just want to check in with Dave here. Uh, the big challenge with the COVID issues is really staff. Um, it's the same people who run in the EOC. And I just want to check in with Dave in terms of what is the, what's the best and the worst time to be having those folks out of the EOC and sitting with council. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. So a couple of things, you know, I think when it, this number seven has a couple of different pieces to it. So one is regarding housing. All of our housing items are agendized uh, in the section eight, which is which is laid into the agenda. And that's why we're often dealing with the, the housing and homeless issues 
um, late into the evening uh, because uh, just by the very nature of how we've set up the agenda. You know, COVID policies, uh, you know, I think if, if I'm taking that, you know, to mean what it says, COVID policies, you know, I think we could, you know, work on where we agendize those. You know, the, the, the report of the city manager 3.1, I think is, you know, not necessarily policy work. It's a report out where we're attempting to provide the council with information what's going on and, and receive input on that. Um, and so, as you know, that's been early in the agenda. And, and we do typically have a lot of staff associated with that item. And so, you know, it would be my preference to, to allow that item to continue as we have, which is um, before consent. Um, but we could be more deliberate. And I think you're right with the rules committee on terms of actual policy work that comes out of COVID that we would agendize maybe later on. And that typically would involve specific staff that we could obviously uh, be available for that time. Okay. So, yeah, I'm happy to uh, take that nudge um, where clearly there are issues of public concern. I, I guess what I would say, Council Member, is, you know, as you, as you know, you've, you've been through enough of these rules committee meetings. Um, we, we generally try to juggle as best we can, uh, not always mindful that, um, some of these things could be in evening council sessions. I assume this is primarily directed toward this period in which we're all stuck online and we're not actually having live council meetings. And so I, I'm certainly happy to adopt as a sort of a priority that where it involves housing or something affecting how we're dealing with COVID outside of 3.1, uh, that we try to push it to the evening where we can. Um, I just wouldn't want to chain ourselves to that when we know um, how long these meetings sometimes are getting, actually often are getting, uh, in which case we may be put, setting ourselves up for having a very short afternoon calendar and then an, an evening calendar that we either can't get done by midnight or has to go on to the next day. Yeah, thank uh, you. Uh, I, I, and and that is my interest right it is really aimed towards uh while we're in this you know predicament with the pandemic and, and doing these zoom meetings and you know i know that we what we did was we sort of rolled over the same practices that we had before for instance land use items holding those in the evening now land use items might have been uh right of, of high interest um or of more priority interest pre-covid but i think now policies around um, COVID or, or housing policies, in my mind, are going to generate even more of a priority interest, and they should be given that opportunity in the evening. And if that means, for instance, that we move some of these land use items or other items that we sometimes have later in the agenda that maybe don't even generate too much of a debate and move those, try to you know make them earlier in the agenda, that's the hope. And so and I, I appreciate, Dave, I'm not, I don't want to move the, the COVID update. I do think that should go first, and I and I recognize why we did that first. Um, but I appreciate if we can separate out the the COVID yeah. policies or any policies that may be be coming out of that, um, and and then a, a priority on the housing items as well. well I, I agree with you that the the interest of the public is certainly shifted. Um, so I'm happy to try to abide by that uh, as a priority, um, and I welcome any comments from other colleagues here on this committee. As I see it, it's primarily item five that we would probably need to have come back in August. Um, and after Tony and everyone have a, has a chance to understand um, some costs and what's what's realistic. And some of these I'll take as a uh, as a cue to myself in terms of my own chairing of the meetings. Uh, and don't hesitate to remind me, uh, Councilman Prowls, if I have forgotten any. I did. I did make an addition at the end there on that number seven to see if we could have staff come back with yes. uh, a solution on on how we can maybe allow our unhoused residents to better participate. So that's not written in the memo. I, I, okay. So yeah, why don't we take that on as well with number five? That, that would be something I could come back to after staff had a chance to think about what is feasible. Um, so I, I know Councilmember Moranis made a motion. It was was not seconded, but. Um, either she or someone else on the committee would like to consider any of what we've discussed. Councilmember Davis? 
Um, I just wanted to ask, is this something that needs to go to the full council or because it's about the way the, the meeting is run, does this just need to come back to rules? A lot, of, a, lot, a lot of these are uh, administrative and can be handled by staff. I think it's yeah. as a discussion flowed through, the chair, uh, the mayor, as chair of the, of the meeting can adopt without having to go to council. This is more procedural and how we operate uh, the meeting. Right. Um, I think things like the translation services, you want to get, get that information and uh, it would have to go to the full council. Okay, so I'll make the motion um, then about item five as well as uh, the item that wasn't, that council member Pearl has referenced that wasn't in the memo about um, outreach to homeless individuals and, and enhancing their participation in the meetings. Does that does that cover everything that, that needs to come back? I believe so. Second. Okay. Uh, and then items three and four, uh, it sounds like uh, Tony's indicated verbally she's, she's ready to do that. Okay. Uh, on that motion, any other comment? All, right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Okay. Thank you. Item eight is... Um, SCA 6 from Senator Dodd regarding gambling and sports wagering. Um, our gambling guru, Lee Wilcox, is here. Thank you for uh, the title upgrade. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so uh, uh, SCA 6 is a constitutional amendment that would allow federally recognized tribes and uh, horse racing establishments to offer both in-person and online sports betting. Um, with the, the uh, in-house betting taxed at 10% and the online tax at 50%, which would go to a new pot, um, the new California Sports Wagering Fund in the, uh, at the state level, with all funds being deposited there. It would also allow certain um, tribal casinos would be allowed to operate dice games such as roulette and craps, which they're not allowed to do now. Um, why we're bringing this to you, it also includes, um, which is very important for this city, it contains the provision that clarifies the, the player dealer rotation for our two card rooms, something that we've discussed with you guys for a number of, of months now. And just as a quick reminder, the card rooms, they do offer uh, banked card games where the dealer um, position rotates amongst the players and the card room can hire a third party dealer to take this position so that all um, players can refuse to um, provide the bank for that game. The card rooms have been concerned um, as the Bureau of Gambling Control at the state uh, level has issued possible new regulations that would severely hamper the third party uh, player position um, of our two card rooms. And, and just as a our two card rooms believe that the revenue loss could be up to 60 to 70% um, for all of the Cal games, um, which would significantly hurt our own revenue into the city. So we are here to ask for approval um, that we continue, that we um, specific for that measure, uh, lend our support to the, the constitutional amendment specific to um, the fix for the card room regulations. Uh, Senator Dodd um, uh, this morning uh, told the Senate Appropriations Committee that he would not be trying to get it out of the Senate Appropriations Committee today to make the November 2020 ballot, but instead would be continuing to work um, on the massive negotiation with the tribal casinos over the next few weeks and be pursuing a November 2022 measure. With that, staff is available for any questions you might have. Thanks, Lee. Uh, we don't have any members of the community like to speak. Uh, is there a motion or comment? Motion to approve. Second. Senator Davis. Thanks. I just have a question. Are we um, adopting a position of support for the entire bill, or are we adopting a position of support specifically for the um, the card room rule? We'd be fine either way. Our support position and, and all of our communications would be specific to the rule change, um, but we'd be fine with, e with either course. Okay. Um, Vice Mayor, I think you made the motion. Was your intent to support the entire item or to support specifically just the card room? 
clarification. It was to support the entire item. Okay, thank you. Okay, anything further on the motion from the vice mayor? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? That passes. Uh, on to item nine, which is a potential ballot measure to amend the city charter. I know there's many, several memos, memoranda here. Uh, I submitted one, which I would admit was uh, very broad. Um, as subsequently, council member Jimenez and vice mayor Jones have submitted a memoranda with a similar direction and council member Prowse as well. Um, is everyone okay if we go to the members of the public first? Okay, so following the rule of Councilmember Perales, we are on item number nine, a potential ballot measure to amend the city charter, uh, and we'll solicit public comment. Um, Eddie Trong. Thank you, Mayor Licardo. Eddie Trong with the Silk and Valley Organization. We are the region's chamber of commerce, representing the interests of over 1,200 businesses within San Jose and the greater region. Um, we're here today to support Mayor Lucar's proposal for an accountability and better government reform measure. At uh, first, we support this proposal because we need a mayor council form of government because it would enhance accountability and transparency. When accountability lines are drawn directly to an elected mayor, the public can have confidence that an elected official is directly responsible for delivering results in the city. We also support limiting the influence of special interest groups by banning lobbyist gifts and political contributions to elected officials. We also support the conflict of interest provisions that other agencies like BTA have already implemented. The two provisions paired together would increase the participation of the community while at the same time uh, allowing elected leaderships to drive results and the political priorities of the city. For almost two years, the SBO and our 70 member board of directors have engaged in conversations about how we can add in good government reforms that will make City Hall more accountable, transparent, and efficient. And so we urge you to move forward with this proposal today and agendize it for a discussion at next week's City Council meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Matt Mason? Hi, um, my name is Matt Mason. I uh, represent uh, over 800 city employees with IFPD Local 21. Um, and I'm speaking in favor of uh, Raul Perales' uh, memorandum. Um, I, I, there has been a, and against the, the, the strong mayor provision, uh, the uh, fair elections initiative um, has been vetted, uh, like uh, Perales has pointed out, um, over the last 18 months um, with hundreds of community meetings, uh, dozens of community groups, uh, over 74,000 signatures, um, and uh, the, uh, changing the rules to allow uh, a mayor or any mayor to have uh, a job decision uh, alone over the chief executive of the uh, uh, city, uh, chief administrative officer of the city, uh, potentially puts uh, a, a sort of creation of potential cronyism in uh, moving forward in this city. Um, so we speak uh, against the other memos uh, and do not believe that our members are represented or the city council uh, members here um, and their constituents who voted for them to have a say in how their budgets or how their city is run through a, a city manager approval process would be, um, would be served the best. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Alex Carabayo. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor and Rules Committee. I'm reading this letter on behalf of the business managers of IBEW Local 332 and UA Local Union 393. Uh, honorable members of the Rules Committee, dear Rules Committee members, we write to support the memorandums of Vice Mayor Jones and Council Member Jimenez to place the Inclusion, Accountability, and Better Government Reforms Charter Amendment on the November 2020 ballot. Our democracy works best when more people participate. By aligning the mayoral election with the presidential election, we will increase the number and the diversity of voters who participate in selecting our city's mayor. Doing so provides a stronger connection and accountability between the community as a whole and San Jose's highest elected office. Further, the proposal by Vice Mayor Jones and Council Member Jimenez will help limit potential undue influence by lobbyists and special interests on our elected officials, as well as city commissions. This provides an added safeguard to ensure that 
The interests of our public are protected against the interests of the powerful and the wealthy. Strong campaign finance and influence laws create strong and publicly responsive governments. Finally, as supporters of the Fair Elections Initiative, we are pleased to see that the thoughtfulness and collaboration prevailed at City Hall, allowing election and campaign finance reform to move forward with a limited expansion of mayoral authority. Sincerely, Steve Flores, business manager, UA393 Plumbers and Pipefitters, Dan Rodriguez, business manager of IBW Local 332 Union Electricians of San Jose and Santa Clara County. Thank you. Uh, Juan Gutierrez? Juan, your device is still muted. There you go. Yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Dear Rules Committee. My name is Juan Gutierrez, and I am the organizer with UA Local 393. I am speaking in support of the recommendation by Council Members Menes and Jones. For over a year, thousands of voters and many council members in San Jose have supported the Fair Elections Initiative, which will increase voter participation by aligning the mayor's election with the present presidential years and limiting campaign contributions from special interests. Hundreds of my union brothers and sisters in San Jose signed the petition for fair elections because it's important and urgent. Hundreds of my union, I mean, the recommendations before you today will help us achieve our shared goals of increasing the number of diversity of voters who participate in selecting our city's mayors. There are no guarantees that our fair elections measure will be placed on any future ballot, so we must act now. Thank you for your support. Thank you, uh, Nathan. Good afternoon, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Members. My name is Nathan Olsh. I'm the Director of Policy and Operations at the San Jose Downtown Association. Uh, for many of us, as you know, this is a very overwhelming nature of recent events. And it's allowed us to reflect profoundly on our state, uh, the state of our city, what will we become? We currently live in uncertain times. Economic downturn has obviously led to pandemic and civil unrest and has tested the trust of the public and put our leaders in an inextricable predicament to respond. This watershed moment is our opportunity to transform our city to move forward and adopt good governance reform. Last week, Mayor LaCarta wrote a memo to amend the city charter in response to the dire need to change our local government to a mayor council. We affirm that this should happen. Representing over 1 million people in our great city, it's warranted. We are no longer in mid to late century 20th, I'm sorry, excuse me, mid to late 20th century era. And if we are the 10th biggest economy, we should probably perform like it. As we have stated in our letter, San Jose's only citywide elected leader, our mayor, should be in a position to lead our city with the efficacy suggested in the proposal with increased authority over the city manager and department heads. We also believe the creation of the citizen committee and sensible campaign finance reform is much needed. We are looking to our electeds to champion this motion and firmly ask the rules committee to place this before council next week and for consideration of the November ballot. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Timothy? Good afternoon, honorable mayor, vice mayor, and council members of the rural committee. Tim Bobian representing the Santa Clara County Association of Realtors and its 6,000 plus membership base. SCORE supports the accountability and better government reforms proposed by Mayor Licardo. San Jose is the 10th largest city in the United States, yet it still operates under an outdated 20th century structure best suited for cities far smaller than San Jose. SCORE has seen the reasonable demands from the public for the mayor to act and respond to this crisis in a more hands-on approach. Under our current form of government, the mayor is unable to do so and does not have the ability to affect the immediate change being asked for. In times of crisis, we need the government to be nimble, responsive, and accountable to the community for results. It is time for San Jose to join other major diverse US cities with the mayor council form of government. The proposed measure would also diminish the influence all special interest groups have in San Jose politics, holding them to the same standards as public agencies such as the VTA. This, along with the change of government structure highlighted above, will allow for more influence from the general public. These structural changes will provide San Jose mayors the modern tools desperately needed to act quickly and effectively in a modern era of constant change. These changes empower our community to have more control over the decisions affecting their, day, their lives daily. SCORE supports these city charter amendments for a more accountable, transparent, and efficient city hall. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, Edmundo? Edmundo, your device appears to be muted still. We're not able to hear you. There you uh -huh. go. We got you, you now. Me? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, my name is Edmundo Escarcega, and I'm a representative with Local Union 393. I'm speaking in support of the recommendations by council members Jimenez and Jones. For over a year, thousands of voters and many council members in San Jose have supported the Fair Elections Initiative, which will increase voter participation by aligning the mayor's elections with presidential years and limiting campaign contributions from special interests. Hundreds of my union brothers and sisters in San Jose signed the petition for fair elections because it is important and urgent. The recommendations before you today will help us achieve our shared goals of increasing the number and diversity of voters who participate in selecting our city's mayor. There are no guarantees that a fair elections measure will be placed on any future ballot, so we must act now. Thank you for your support. Thank you. Uh, Moto G. There we go. Hi. Um, I apparently fell through the looking glass today because I gave Chappie credit. Raul heard what I said and took it into account, which I appreciate. And now I'm going against Sergio. So what the hell? Um, I cannot support uh, Sergio's memo. Um, I just don't want to see the mayor uh, get any more power. I think he's uh, way too supportive of Eddie and Eddie's gotta go, um, and the mayor's gotta go. So I just can't support it. Um, I just don't want to um, see the mayor get more power. I think a lot of the decisions that he makes are uh, punitive and arbitrary. Uh, thank you, Raul, for defending free speech today. I really appreciate that, because Lord knows I'm one of those people that somehow he misses my hand a lot, even in person. Um, and, um, so I just really think that we don't need to see uh, him get more power. I just don't think that he's necessarily a good decision maker. I think that he sides with big business and look at the people who are calling in. When you've got SVO and the Realtors Association calling in, like I'm certainly never on the same side they're on. Um, so I just think that that's a big sign. I know the unions are calling in, but you know I don't always agree with them either. They make a lot of bad decisions and support a lot of bad candidates. Sorry guys. Uh, have a good day. Thank you, Blair. Hi, uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for this item. Uh, the mayor seems to be, uh, you know, trying to work out, you know, I guess my word for the day is, you know, what, what can be eternal practices for San Jose? What are, what are our good eternal practices? And, um, you know, that's important to the mayor. It's important to all of us. Um, I think uh, what I think the Perales memo seems to offer is how that the mayor's memo can be compromised and there can be room for compromise. And, you know, I think San Jose is just seems to have had a tradition of, of not the big city mayor idea that the mayor wants to promote at this time. And for the Perales uh, memo to be really talked about and haggled over, uh, it's important, I think. I think uh, it, it offers a lot of different choices. And it's how do we how do we talk about those choices that that uh, I, I really like about it a lot. So thank you uh, for for working on this issue, and I, I, su I suppose more importantly, um, a thank you that item seven on the mayor's list of uh, police uh, changes at this time to things to work on. Number seven of nine was uh, how can the mayor's office have more uh, control over the SJPD decision making. And how can that be a part of a, an elected body? And I think that's 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 an, uh, uh, the ideas of you know an elected body making decisions over its local police has to be considered like an eternal for our city and for this country. And for the mayor to work on that and, and list that as number seven, you know, it's small, it's idealistic, but it can accomplish a lot. And I just I maybe that can be a, a focus in how you'll be making uh, decisions about. Uh, long-term decision making for San Jose with these uh, with these other uh, ballot initiative ideas so thank you for your help thank you Brian Brian you. there you go yeah we can hear you thank you good afternoon my name is Brian Dane I'm the staff rep for AFSCME MEF 
The Municipal Employees Federation is by far the largest bargaining unit in the city of San Jose, and I want to speak up very strongly against any strong mayor provision. The workers I represent are under normal circumstances working on the front lines of this city, and during COVID-19, they've been nothing less than heroic working throughout the community. To my members, the most important single city leader is the city manager. We've seen that especially now during these dark times, and I do want to take the time to thank uh, Dave Sykes uh, for his leadership. I believe one of the things that makes a good leader, a good city manager, is independence. Uh, the strong mayor system would take that away. He or she would be subject to the whims of a strong mayor and would be unable to act independently on behalf of this city and its employees as well without fear of losing his or her job. It would take away from the checks and balances we currently have and reduce the power of the city council, each of whom is elected by their constituents in different districts to have a greater say and seat at the table. We hear about how much the leaders of our city are proud of our workers during COVID-19. As someone who represents them, I'd like to say that pushing something that would so profoundly change the way San Jose operates in a way that also directly affects those employees without holding community forums, informational meetings and the like is wrong and it's unacceptable. Thank you. The person with the phone number ending 7235, welcome. Uh, yes, this is Mary Blanco. I'm a business rep for Operating Engineers Local 3. I oppose the strong mayor proposal because I don't like the way this proposal is being rushed through with little to no involvement from the community or other stakeholders. I, as a labor advocate, just recently learned about this days ago, about this proposal coming forward and had to scramble to familiarize myself with it to address it here today. Your residents have other issues on their mind at this time, but I am certain they would like to provide input given sufficient notice. I believe we need to be transparent about the mayor and city council's actions, and don't believe we are doing this with this, the timing of this proposal. In addition, why are we spending money we don't have on a proposal that hasn't been fully vetted? I urge the Rules Committee to reject this proposal, the strong mayor proposal. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay, returning to the uh, panel, uh, Either uh, Vice Mayor Jones or Councilmember Jimenez like to speak to your uh, memos, uh, Vice Mayor? Yes, uh, thank you, Mayor. So um, this is actually a unique opportunity to, to transform uh, the city of San Jose and how we govern. Uh, there's a lot of cynicism right now, a lot of distrust in government and our residents are questioning some of the decisions that we're making and, and questioning who's making or who's influencing us on those decisions. And we're moving forward or we're proposing some um, proposals that will go a long way in terms of creating transparency and at least minimizing some of the uh, distrust and, um, and um, feelings that our constituents have in terms of why we make the decisions that we make. We also wanna see accountability. Uh, I'm involved with um, the National League of Cities uh, Council President and Vice Mayor um, Group. So I have many conversations with that organization and I have an, I've had an opportunity to talk with my peers and colleagues about how their form of government operates in terms of the strong mayor form of government versus our current form of government. And like anything else, there's, there's pluses and minuses, pros and cons, but there are a lot of uh, positives around that structure. One pro is the fact that there's an expectation of our residents that the mayor has a certain amount of authority and power to make things happen. If you look at some of the decisions that the mayor of Atlanta has made, some of the mayors of other big cities have made in terms of responding to the needs of the community and their residents, particularly in times of crisis, is a case study in terms of why that form of government can be highly effective. That does not mean that the council's authority and abilities and powers are greatly diminished. It just means that the, the powers and authorities are different. But there, there are a lot of pros in terms of having a strong, um, strong mayor a strong council president, as well as a strong council. That's not to diminish the hard work that uh, I've seen the city manager, Dave Sykes, has done. But also, Dave, I've seen you in situations where 
you have many masters who are trying to give you direction. And you've done a, a masterful job of navigating through that. And I'm guilty of that myself. But in order to be effective as a city and implement a lot of the policies and objectives that we want to accomplish, we're going to have to have a different structure. The structure that we currently have was great for San Jose of 200,000 residents or 300,000 residents. But for a city of a million people, we need to have a structure that's going to be impactful and effective. If you talk to uh, other mayors and other council members in other major cities, you are not, well, at least I have not heard them say, hey, Vice Mayor Jones, we would like to actually go to your form of government because we think that would be a better form of government and be more effective. That conversation has not happened because the feeling of those council members is that the, the current structure that they're in is impactful and productive and it moves the city along to achieve their objectives. I also want to uh, talk to um, changing the mayoral election cycle. My goal is to see that we have enhanced voter participation in all elections, not just the presidential election, but midterm elections and any other election that we have. We need to have everybody participate and be involved. And so I initially was thinking about this as an either or, but I've evolved in terms of an all of the above. I wanna see um, more young people, more uh, people of color, more, more people that have been shut out of the system and haven't been involved or don't feel that they have a voice. I wanna see them involved and in the system and participating in voting. So that's why I wanna pursue a, a all of the above strategy. Again, a city council race and a midterm election cycle is important. Electing judges, voting for ballot measures, all those things that need to take place and we need to have everybody involved and have their voices heard in all elections. But again, we're gonna have an all of the above strategy and try to make sure that everybody feels included and is involved in the process. I have a couple of um, administrative changes that I wanna to make to our proposal. Uh, one is on Item two G, where it says um, so, where it currently says, consistent with the current provisions in the char uh, charter, the mayor shall have the authority to propose, and the mayor and council shall, through a vote of the majority, have the authority to appoint direct or dismiss the city attorney, the city auditor, and the independent police auditor. I wanna modify that to say nothing in this reform, nothing in these reforms alters the relevant charter sections that govern the appointment, direction, and dismissal of the city attorney, the city auditor, and the independent police auditor. So effectively what we're saying is we don't wanna see any changes to the charter that impacts those three positions. Another change uh, is under inclusion, accountability and better government reforms. I like to have language that says reforms take effect January 1st, 2021, unless otherwise noted. So those are the changes I'd like to make, and I'd like to make a motion to move my memo, my memo as well as Council Member Hermenez's memo forward. And there's motion. Is there a second? I'll... I will second it. Uh, seconded by Council Member Davis. Uh, Council Member Hermenez. Thank you, Mayor. I, I think it's, uh, can, can you hear me just fine? Yes, we can. Okay, I, uh, I certainly agree with some of the changes that were made and uh, for anyone that's uh, watching what's going on, you, you, you probably clearly saw that the, that the memos for the most part, uh, especially in the direction were the same. So um, 
I concur with those revisions. I think it adds some clarity and some added protections. Um, I guess one of the things that comes to mind as we're talking about this is that uh, I feel like we've been going around in circles uh, about this for some time. Um, and, I, and I'm glad we're finally sort of taking it head on. Um, I, I know it was probably a little odd to see my name uh, on some of these reforms as, as, as was stated by some of the folks that were commenting, even some of my uh, colleagues uh, might have wondered, uh, but I think this is very important that we get this over the finish line. Um, I think it's also important to acknowledge that this is not, uh, y you know, these reforms and what we're suggesting isn't perfect. And I'm, I am not, I am not happy with every inch of what we're proposing. But uh, uh, what I've learned very quickly in this job is that when uh, uh, different sides are feeling a little discomfort as to what we're proposing, that uh, is an indication of a good compromise. And so I think that this does just that. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, as we go through the memo, um, there's different sections, as we all know. And I think, uh, as you can clearly see and hear from some of the comments from the participants on this, uh, on this meeting, is that the majority of the concern, if not all the concern, really comes from um, the additional powers to the mayor, right? Uh, and any mayor, quite frankly, right? After Sam Licardo, and certainly uh, Mayor Licardo is going to be able to, to inherit some of these, uh, you know, if, this, uh, if these recommendations stay in place, right? Um, and so uh, with regard to the campaign finance and conflict of interest reforms, I think those are very important. Uh, I think uh, if you talk to any resident, they would recognize that those are much needed. Uh, and so those, that's why I think those are obviously very um, easily accepted. Uh, inclusive government, obviously, that's important as well. And, and, and to be honest with you, that is probably the most important part of this for me. Um, I think that in this 200 plus history of the city of San Jose, we've had two women elected, and in the modern, modern day history, we had two men of color elected. Uh, if you run those numbers any which way, if you're a statistician, a math major, whatever it may be, you know that those numbers aren't where they should be. And I really do think that this uh, reform has the, the possibility, just as district elections had, uh, to really change the dynamic and, and the type of representation, uh, ethnic you know, diversity, geographic diversity of folks that have the potential to run for office and become mayor of the city. Uh, it can be my daughter, it can be my son, it can be a host of other folks. And I really do think that this opens up that door. And that's why this is one of the main reasons I'm signing on to this is that I think this is very important. Um, however, I also, I, I do understand that um, uh, their uh, council member Peral has submitted some recommendations. I had a chance to briefly read through his memorandum. I know we talked about some charter review committees and things of that nature. And I think those are vitally important. I certainly, if you've seen any of the comments I've made during my close to four years being in office, I take uh, public involvement very seriously, right? Uh, and, and, and this is coming from a council member who recently had to, uh, you know, and I voted against it, but my community got, uh, you know, is now moving through uh, getting two bridge housing locations put forward. It certainly wasn't the ideal public process, uh, but I've, uh, you know, I've taken ownership of it. And we're going to make it a success. But uh, and so I'm sensitive to that and I appreciate the comments in his memo. Um, I think one thing that makes me feel better about what we're doing, uh, given some of uh, the comments in, around the charter review committees, is that uh, number four in our memo, the Blue Ribbon Commission on Better Government. Um, if you read that, I think the first few sentences touch on the fact that uh, and I'll actually read it because I think it's important for folks that are listening or on the phone to, to understand it. So it essentially says, a commission shall be established to study the effectiveness of these reforms and to report on the effectiveness or need for modification to these changes by March of 2022. And I think that's important uh, because these powers as stated in our memo, the additional powers uh, future mayors will get will not kick in till July, 2023 the start of that fiscal year. And so I think in my mind that there are, there is some time uh, that, Blue, that Blue Ribbon Commission's formed, if they come up with recommendations, some, some, some thoughtful sort of things that should be added or, or, or taken back as it relates to some of the reforms we're making, I think it still allows time to get those in. So in effect, it is doing uh, what I think uh, uh, Council Member Perales seeks through, through mentioning of the Charter Review Committee. Um, and, and given that the additional powers to the mayor are the main bone of contention, it seems to me, I think this would leave enough time to, to really address those in, in, a, in a more thoughtful, not in a more thoughtful way, but be more inclusive of some of the maybe uh, buried 
thoughts on the topic in the community. And so uh, with that, uh, I, I, you know, I hope this moves to the full council for a broader discussion. I know there's a lot of different, different opinions uh, coming forward, uh, but I really do think that this is the best, uh, uh, the best compromise we can slap together uh, where I think everyone um, really goes away walking with something in hand. Um, and I think the residents of the city uh, that is extremely diverse are going to be the, the the beneficiaries for many many years to come. So that's why I'm supporting. It. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Reynolds. I think uh, Councilmember Perales has also a memo. So if he wants to speak before me, um, sure. Uh, Councilmember uh, Perales. Yeah, happy to. Thank you. Um, and I think um, I couldn't disagree more with the comments that have been stated by uh, my colleagues, Vice Mayor Jones and, and Councilmember Jimenez. Um, and, and in fact, to Councilmember Jimenez's comments that he just made, uh, I think he makes the great argument that I'm trying to make in my memo, which is why are we rushing this? When we're talking about not implementing even changes that, uh, that, that are being suggested, until after uh, a 2023 time frame, and we want to put together a, a blue ribbon commission, which uh, the proper name um, is the Charter Revision Commission. It's nothing new. Uh, we don't have to create something new. This has been going on since the early 1900s. Uh, anytime we make significant changes to our charter, we uh, invite our public to be a part of that process. Uh, in fact, the strong mayor discussion has been brought up numerous times to the Charter Revision Commission. Uh, almost every single time the discussion was led for over a year before something was actually agreed upon to be put on a ballot. Um, and, and we have the opportunity to do that here again, should we choose to, rather than rush and spend nearly $1.6, $1.7 million uh, and put the cart before the horse to put something on the ballot and then, and then later on retroactively try to come back and fix it. Uh, it, it doesn't make sense to me at all why this would, uh, would sound like a good idea to any of us, especially given uh, the concerns that Vice Mayor Jones brings up in regards to uh, the, the nature of the environment that we're in right now. Uh, I would agree, it's very, uh, very sensitive, very tense. Um, and here we are uh, telling the public that we, uh, we don't value their opinion on something that is gonna change uh, the future quite drastically, um, and uh, that we don't want to go through the traditional uh, charter revision process that we've gone through in the past uh, to be able to actually vet out these decisions. Uh, so I, I think I've spelled it out pretty clearly uh, in my memorandum. I would actually um, ask that the, the um, committee here don't even support moving this on to the full council. Uh, I think that would be an insult that we even have to spend time on something that was brought up so abruptly uh, by our mayor on, on Friday and then by Vice Mayor Jones and Councilmember Jimenez just yesterday on an agenda that we know is already extremely packed with something that has absolutely zero urgency to be moving forward uh, for this November ballot. There is an opportunity to get all of these things, uh, whether a, a community agrees to them or not, but let's say that they do. Uh, there's an opportunity to move all of these forward uh, in the future with respect to the community and, and inviting a community process. There's absolutely no reason for urgency here. Uh, so I, I asked my colleagues to actually uh, agree to my memorandum. Um, and, and the only thing we should be agreeing to today is to, to convene the Charter Revision Commission. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Marinas. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm not sure uh, what the problem is that we're trying to solve. I, I'm trying to be as objective as I can um, when I'm taking a look at my colleagues' um, memos, uh, as well as your memo, uh, Mayor. And I question, um, are we in such a failed state? I mean, is our local government in such a failed state that we've been talking about this failed state for months, weeks, or even days, that we would actually require a restructure? I mean, you, you, we've been working through crisis after crisis, and I've got to say, you know, uh, my admiration for, for um, all of the public administrators who've dedicated themselves through a lot of, a lot of what we're going through and making, them ha making that happen. Um, but we've been coming out of these crises or traversing through the crisis because we're not finished with them as a better city, 
um, better engaged with our community, as we heard earlier um, with another proposal uh, from Councilwoman Perales, uh, with better engagement. And I, I think really some responsive programs that are addressing our communities. And just, just last week, we approved the Office of Racial Equity. We approved the increased homeless prevention dollars. We, create, uh, we approved digital inclusion solutions, housing solutions for our unhoused, and, and as well as a, a process to reimagine the police department. And I think you're gonna make it, uh, uh, an announcement about that mayor tomorrow. Um, so I wouldn't call that failure. I would say that those are absolute successes in light of crisis. And when you bring the voices of the community, that's when we're successful. Because when we are doing the work by ourselves, that's a monopoly. That's not government, that's not public administration. Then that, that belongs in a business structure. And I think our current form of government, I think we've addressed it, this current, uh, form of government addresses and keeps at bay corruption and consolidation of power. And, and so, I mean, are we considering giving a voice to all of our communities through council member representation and district specific representation a problem? Is, is that the problem or is that a problem we, we want to create by opting for this type of, of government structure? Because that's where we're heading with a strong mayor we wouldn't necessarily have professional public administrators in their respective fields like we do now. Um, those positions would probably typically go to allies of whoever the mayor is in, in place. And really as public servants and representatives, we have an obligation to include our community into processes. So council member Perales's memo speaks to me um, it remains, it keeps us transparent and accountable. And, you know, we, we just um, approved a, a resolution for Black Lives Movement, Black, Black Lives Matter Movement. Um, and, and we approved equity last week. We, we need this current structure because it gives representation to all of the people of color. So I'm actually very disappointed in the memos from my colleagues from um, Council Member Jimenez, Vice Mayor Jones, uh, for supporting a strong mayor that will leave out people of color and for leaving out our communities and putting this charter amendment proposal. People are, of color are expecting us, each one of us to represent them well. And through our current government structure, that is what we can do. In a strong mayor, that is going to be absolutely compromised. And I don't want to compromise that representation of people of color. Um, someone said that, you know, a, a city manager has many masters because he has, you know, 10 different um, council members to report to, but that's part of a check and balance system. That's part of check and balances. And that's part of um, balancing the needs of all of the constituents in San Jose. So I want us to avoid having one master that can shout out the voices that they don't agree with. This proposal is really just against the grain of what we've heard our community express and we've spent hours hearing those. And so I know that you know what I'm talking about. What does a strong mayor address in this city that is happening currently that is so broken that we need to change the government structure? And I'm gonna tell you there isn't anything because this is a masked proposal, masked by a fair elections initiative. And, and actually this is proof that we already have a strong mayor, that, that this, this kind of proposal can move forward without any constituent engagement process or analysis. Um, this, isn't, this isn't about the fair elections initiative. This is about a mayor moving their priorities without a question. And so, all of, the, all of these proposals, of course, have created so many questions for me. I don't know that I really expect any of these questions to be answered, but I was thinking about what we as council members bring to the table, and that is the voices of our respective districts. And if a council member, and I thought if a council member in a planning department um, were working on bringing the community into a, like a planning process to improve a project, 
uh, proposal, but the mayor disagreed with the direction that that particular council member was taking, could the mayor direct the planning director to take a different approach? I mean, would it mean that the mayor would have direct control of the Google project and all the details that come back to council would only be with his blessing. I, this gives too much power to one office. And if you, uh, if you vote for this, you're essentially um, muting your own self and consider yourself moot point in terms of district representation. So I'd like to make a substitute motion to move council member Perales's memo. I motion from council member Reynes. Is there a second? Uh, motion fails. Uh, of course, it would. Councilman Kimmis. Yeah, Mayor, and I, 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 first, I don't, I don't, I think that both of these memos are all four of the memos are going to end up going to our council meeting because there's nothing preventing Council Member uh, per, uh, Perales or Jimenez or. Uh, Vice Mayor Chappie Jones for putting it forward as long as this thing is going to be discussed. So, and I know that everyone on this council agrees that our goal in any election cycle is to increase voter engagement. I think that I'm hoping that that, that is, I believe that's the intention of this, this proposal. And I believe that this proposal is made with uh, good intentions. However, I think that there could be unintended consequences my concern by shifting the, may the mayoral race to the presidential cycle is that we'll actually decrease voter engagement for the five remaining districts on the gubernatorial ballot. And I've said this before, uh, not because I don't think that uh, there will be more voters uh, voting for mayor, but who's gonna be voting for all the odd numbered districts? And I'm willing to put this forward to be discussed on Tuesday the 30th, but I'm skeptical that we will have the desired results. Um, and may, you know, in the end, if it passes, it may end up harming uh, public invade, voter engagement. I'm also concerned about the increased powers of, um, uh, it may, maybe I have a question for, in fact, it is a question for the, the current motion that's on the, uh, floor, which is, so in your proposal, the, the mayor will fire or hire the city manager uh, without approval of the council? Vice mayor or yeah, I, I, so, Alex, um, yeah. So, um, I'm looking for the item right now. See that what the mayor is. So your question is on item E. Both the mayor and the city manager have the authority to dismiss department heads. No, no, or, that's not my. That's that's not my um, question. My question is: Does the mayor have the sole uh, authority to 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 hire and fire the city manager at his will without council approval? Under, under your proposal? So the changes in the charter giving the mayor the authority to dismiss the city manager and department head shall not take effect until July 1st, 2023. So the answer to your question is that the mayor would not have the ability to do that until July 1st, 2023. Yeah, and we're, I'm, I, I realize that this is not going to be implemented in the next few years, but but this is this concerns the the future of the city and how it's run and the actual power of the council. So while I I agree with many of the points that you're trying to put forward, that the campaign contributions and all that, um, I you know I'm I, and I'm 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 not 100% convinced as to the need to go to the presidential election, but. That, that I think I could possibly support as well. But if we give 100%, if we, and, and maybe I should leave this to the later date, but I just want you to have this idea in mind um, because I'm hoping that compromises can be had 
that will make this more palatable. Uh, I, I could tell you that if the mayor has the sole authority, and, and I can, um, I, there's no offense to this mayor. I'm, I'm hoping that nobody gets offended by this because this is a touchy situation. Um, if, if the mayor has sole authority to hire and fire the city manager without uh, the council at the table in any way, then the city manager has no reason to come meet with us every month to actually work on the priorities that we have for our districts in any way. And we will have no authority otherwise, unless we're buddy buddy with the mayor. Now, it, it, it might work. It might work for council members. And again, it doesn't affect me in any way because I'm out of office, and you guys will have to deal with some of these decisions in the future, and not myself. And and it sounds like this mayor is not going to have the power to do these things anyway. However, the um, I'm, ta I'm looking out for the future here. It, it will it will not allow council to have much of a say so in any way. Uh, it, when it comes to the city manager. In fact, if this passes the way it, it, it's currently uh, uh, proposed, there's no need for the city manager to even meet with council members. So I, I just want you guys to put that into your thought process. Um, I'm, I'm okay with some of the other uh, ideas, but that one scares me a little for future council members. Again, I'm not doing this for myself. I've been thinking about this theoretically what I, what I could compromise with and what I can't live with. And this is one that I don't think I could live with. But what I can say is I'm gonna, uh, I am gonna support the motion to discuss it uh, for the June 30th meeting. And I'm, and I'm hoping that we can come with, um, um, you know, what are the potential unintended consequences? I know, again, I, I wanna stress this, that I think all of these folks, both the, the, the mayor, the vice mayor, uh, the unions and um, the business leaders all have the intention of making our city run better. Um, and so I want to make sure that I'm, I'm stressing on that, but I feel that uh, we, we have to strike a good balance and not just, um, and, and, not, and not just go forward with a current uh, proposal. So, but I will support it going forward to the full uh, council on the 30th. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Davis. I see that Dave uh, has his hand up and I'd like to defer to Dave before I give my comments. Dave, you wanna jump in? Yeah, just wanted to make sure our, I, I understood the vice mayor's motion because I think what he verbally entered into the motion was that all aspects of the memo would take effect on January 1st, 2021 unless noted in the me uh, memo. So in my mind, all of the items would be January, 2021, with the exception of really uh, section E, which is the uh, dismissal, hiring and dismissal provisions that would take place later. So I just wanted to make sure I have clarity on that and, and everyone discussing has clarity on that. Yes, you, you are correct, Dave. Okay. Um, anything further, Dave? No, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Councilor Davis. Thank you. Um, I just want to make sure I'm clear on the motion. Vice Mayor Jones, you moved uh, your memo and Council Member Jimenez's memo. That's correct. Are you um, are you also willing to move? Just move forward the Mayor's memo as well as Council Member Perales's memo, and I understand that they are. Uh, some of them are mutually exclusive, but I think that for purposes of discussion for charter changes and possible charter changes, that we should just move them all forward as one item for discussion for the full council. I, the reason I seconded it, just to be uh, perfectly clear, is I don't think this discussion is something that we should be having as just our little rules committee. And I think it is something for the full council to discuss and debate and decide. And I appreciate that, uh, that you Vice Mayor and, and Council Member Jimenez have, have given more details um, for us to discuss, but I think there are still, as Council Member Camus pointed out, I think there are still details to be worked out and to do that in a full council discussion makes the most 
sense to me. Uh, Council Member Davis, if we move our, um, our memos forward as they currently are, uh, Council Member Perales is still gonna have the opportunity to, to have that discussion. So I'm, I'm not quite sure I understand what the additional benefit is of moving his memo forward. So his memo is about um, a convening, which is actually a subset of what the mayor had called for uh, to for a further uh, convening for charter changes. So it it may it may not need to have include council member Paulus's memo, but the the item that I'm specifically thinking of is actually in the as I'm looking now is in the mayor's memo about um, directing the city clerk to possibly establish additional dates for us to have public discussion and input before we finalize a measure. And um, if you look at... Um, Did I miss it in your memo? Yes. Sorry. It's, Is that included in... Item, item C. Direct city clerk, clerk to establish an additional meeting date in the final week of July and or first week of August if necessary for public discussion and input for this measure. I'm sorry, thank you. I, I missed I missed that last page. Thank you. Um, I do appreciate that. I think as, as council member Cam has pointed out and as council member Arenas has pointed out, there are many items for us to discuss when we're talking about such a large change, there there are pros and cons to to both types, the different types of government that we're talking about, the council manager form of government and the the mayor council form of government. And I'd like to flesh that out, not here, not today, but um, with the full council and with more with more input from from the public. And I I do think having this discussion on Tuesday is is a start, starting this discussion on Tuesday and meeting again. Um, I we've had a lot, <laughs> we've had a lot happen in 2020. And I I think changing the the form of government will not necessarily decrease the amount of um, maybe misunderstanding on the limits of our form of government, just in terms of what we can do as, as a council, not just what the mayor can do, but we what we as the city government can do versus county government versus school districts. There's still misunderstanding about that. And I think that will remain, but I do understand why it is important for, for us to be, to be more nimble um, when we when we have these big big issues come up, so that's why I sec I just want to be clear. That's why I seconded the motion, and I'm looking forward to the the broader discussion on Tuesday. Thank you, Councilmember Reyes. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Mayor. So I just wanted to ask a little bit more about. Um, I know that you uh, and both uh, Councilmember Jimenez mentioned the Blue Ribbon Task Force. Um, did you ever consider a charter revision commission? I mean, it, it sounds like you want to have some level of engagement for our community. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering what your thoughts were in terms of uh, preferring the blue ribbon commission. Versus uh, a, a charter. Um, a, give me a little bit more context in terms of, of what your- uh, so, so the, the historically, anytime our charter um, has any ch revisions to it, there is a charter revision commission. Starts from 1915. I think we we got a, a bit of the overview from Councilman Perales. There's times where you, there's two different previous times where the council considered a strong mayor had a um, charter revision commission set up. Um, uh, very independent from the council to discuss it and um, some level of engagement for our from our community before they proposed 
anything. So they took a look at what, what is, you know, basically what's the problem we're trying to solve? How do we solve it? Do we solve it with a strong mayor? Do we solve it with making some uh, different kinds of changes to our current uh, government structure? And I mean, I think that's why we ended up with where we are right now. Um, and even though, um, I mean, we still have a strong mayor role. Um, and I think through, through that leadership, we've been able to, um, like I said, we've been able to traverse a lot of crises. And I think we've, we've you, you know, as a city, we've, uh, I feel very proud of where we're at, um, despite some of the restraint, constraints that we have um, from a federal and county uh, forms of government that impact our decisions. But that's like uh, Councilmember Davis was saying, that's really out of our hands. And I don't know that our community understands that, but we, we do. And we know that before we, we make a huge change like this, usually we need some analysis and that Charter Revision Commission provides that. So, you know, we, put, we can't put the cart before the horse. You can't say, let's, let's try this out and, and see how it fares out. Um, so I wanted to understand more why, why the Blue Ribbon Task Force instead of a, did you ever consider a Charter Revision Commission? No, uh, no, we didn't consider one for this particular um, proposal. Uh, I'm sure that in the past that, that has provided value, but uh, we don't always have uh, go through that level of um, effort to put something on the charter. Now, I know that this is a significant change and it's gonna change the direction of, uh, potentially the direction of the city in terms of how it's governed, but there are gonna be opportunities for this to be vetted. Uh, we're gonna debate it and discuss it in council multiple times. It's gonna to go to a campaign. It's gonna be on a ballot where there's lots of opportunity to, to vet, get input from, from the voters, and then they're gonna make a decision on whether this is something they want to move forward with or not. So mm -hmm. that's that's why we came up with the, the path that we did. But we also recognize that there's a, an opportunity or potential to make other changes that we can go through a process like a commission to review and make recommendations for the next election cycle. Mm -hmm. I guess it's still, and thank you for answering that, uh, Vice Mayor. I, I guess for me, it's not clear what we're trying to solve. And so if it's not clear what we're trying to solve and I don't see you know, um, changing our structure just because other major cities do it or have it is uh, sufficient enough um, to, to diminish uh, the uh, district specific representation of council members. Um, so I don't know what we're trying to solve. And I think a commission, uh, a charter revision commission would help us analyze that, would create maybe an independent body that could give us those recommendations, much like the salary um, commission does for ourselves, right? We have decided we don't wanna vote on that ourselves uh, because that can create a, a conflict. And so I think a commission like this could also create a very independent recommendation and, and review for us, where is it that we are um, not doing so well? Right? Is it in fact the structure? Is it is it maybe that we need to have more merit-based uh, performance evaluations for our directors that connect with directly with our priorities? I mean, what is it that we're trying to solve for? And for me, it isn't clear um, because there's there's so much in this proposal, um, uh, just kind of all, you know, it's a patchwork of different priorities. Um, and uh, any given Tuesday, we, we could reform how, you know, not accepting gifts, because we've done that before. We don't need to put that on chart uh, on, a, on the ballot. So, I mean, I, I just think that there's other paths for this, and I, I don't understand what it, it is that we're trying to solve for, um, because I don't know that our city is, is you know, in such a, in such uh, a disarray or such uh, to a point where we're failing our community. I actually think we, we, we're not, and I'm really proud of the work that we're doing. And so I think for me, this is, uh, um, this doesn't make sense. No, I appreciate that, uh, Council Member Arenas, and, and I, I respect your opinion. Um, the problem that we're trying to solve is 
to have a form of government or structure of government to be as responsive to our constituents and our community as possible. Uh, I've personally seen time after time situations where uh, because of multiple direction or um, multiple uh, demands on the city manager's office that, uh, and, and again, Dave Sykes, you do a, a tremendous job and, and I really admire the work that you do and the way you're kind of, you're able to manage and navigate through all this. But I also see all the inefficiencies in that process. And I want to move forward with a form of government where we can be more responsive, more adaptable and more accountable to our residents. Uh, the expectations of a mayor for a big city like San Jose are for his ability to be able to execute and implement things quickly, rapidly, be able to adjust, adapt. And right now we don't have that form of government and we're seeing it uh, unfold in this, this crisis that we're in. And it's a, it's a perfect example. And so I wanna correct that but I also want to be able to have a process where we can modify and make changes in the future. But I think there's an immediate need right now to make those changes so we could be a more effective government. So is that the reason for um, the expediency on this? I mean, it, 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 I don't know that we've been that expedient on any matter. Um, we, we just took off the ACA uh, five resolution because we had so much on our plate and we've, we've been prioritizing different items um, so far on this agenda and taking them off and, um, and making sure that we um, are, uh, uh, recognize the workload of, of folks. And so this also creates a workload for folks as well as, um, as, a, um, as a, a cost to our residents that they have not agreed to um, or even asked about. And so I think a, um, a commission that can do this separately from us, us as Charter Revision Commission can actually do that um, without creating additional workload um, for, for, for our, our staff. Um, you know, and obviously this is, this is where I'm coming from. I think that I don't know what the problem is. I don't know what the problem we're trying to solve because I think that um, I don't see the, I see the, um, the mayor actually you, you have been very successful and very adaptive and been um, uh, as uh, as responsible I think as he can be um, and I think the restraints that that surround these crises are not around the mayor's role but around the role of public health and the role of the federal government and just um, structural racism and um, you know our mayor is not responsible for that he's not <laughs> and that's Silly, right? I, he's not responsible for that. So I'm not sure that that's still um, enough for us to change what we're doing. Um, but I, I can see, I can count my, I can count the votes. I know that this will go on to Tuesday's um, conver uh, conversation. And I thank you, um, Council Member Davis. I know that you said that this shouldn't just lie here and we shouldn't just have this conversation here. Um, I do agree that this needs to be a larger conversation. And that's why we have district specific representation because we all bring something to the table. And as women, we bring a different voice. And as people of color, we bring a different voice. And I wanna make sure that when I continue to represent my community, that those voices are heard through me and not actually shut out. And I think this, we, we're, we will be making a huge mistake um, in shutting down our community by having, um, by having this change, but um, you know that's just my opinion on, on that matter. But I also think there's an opinion in terms of process, and process is very skewed right now. I don't know that we are being as transparent, as accountable that as we can be, and and that is a failure of all of us if if this continues to move forward. Um, and so we will be held accountable for that. Um, anyways, thank you for for answering those questions, Vice Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Perales. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate Councilmember uh, Arenas the question, and I don't think it, I don't think it has to be answered here because it sounds like this is going to go forward to Tuesday. But I do think uh, I'd like my colleagues to be prepared with uh, to answer what's the rush um, because I, I don't see why are we going to be again spending nearly 1.7 million dollars 
uh, to then create a public process after the fact and maybe put something to fix whatever we did wrong this time around to, to make it better um, when we're talking about moving a mayor's race, which the next one will be 2024. Um, and we're talking about potential implementations and changes that we want to have delayed. Um, I, I don't understand the rush, so hopefully you're, you're prepared to, to be able to defend that on Tuesday. And um, uh, I do appreciate Councilmember Davis's suggestion. Uh, I think it would just be a nice gesture uh, to move all the memos. And then the only addition I'd make uh, would be, uh, I know Vice Mayor Jones, he did it unintentionally, but I think when we speak to future mayors and, and Councilmember Davis will appreciate this, we should say him or her. Okay. All right. Thank you, Councilmember Browse. Uh, Councilmember Arenas would also appreciate that. Yes. I sure would. I sure would. We would all appreciate it. So that's what we'll all do. All right. Um, I, I just want to weigh briefly here before the vote. I think everyone has laid out, I think, arguments we will hear uh, probably on Tuesday and, and more information. I do want to clarify first, I think the $1.7 million, obviously, we should look at that. Um, my understanding is we are moving forward with an IPA measure anyway. Um, so I'm assuming that number is quite a bit less than that. Um, that is the cost of an additional measure. The Charter Commission, which I think is really the same concept that Councilmember uh, Jimenez and Vice Mayor uh, Jones have proposed anyway, this Blue Ribbon Commission, uh, <clears throat> whether you call it Charter Commission, Blue Ribbon Commission, whatever it might be. Uh, there have been many changes to the Charter. I can think of just four off the top of my head in 2010, Measure M, 2012, 2016, with Measure B, the IPA measure we're kind of playing now, we, we don't have charter commissions with every change to the charter. Uh, we do sometimes, we don't know the times. Um, and, and you know, I think it is important. I know Council Member uh, Aranis several times called this a strong mayor. It's not a strong mayor. Strong mayor has veto authority over a council. Uh, strong mayor has typically authority to hire and fire, not a dozen people, but usually hundreds of people within a, a city structure of government. Uh, I think this is this measure is very clear. It retains council authority over policy making that's there in Charter Section 400. So this is not a strong mayor. This is simply an adaptation of the current hybrid that we have toward a hybrid that gives the mayor some more authority. Um, in terms of the question about what has failed, and I know this is really an important question we're going to ask, have more in-depth conversation on Tuesday. I don't think anything's failed. I think Dave has done an extraordinary job. I think the folks. Uh, who've been working incredibly hard in the EOC and everybody uh, on this city staff, we are blessed to have a very, very talented and able and excellent uh, city staff and great leadership uh, throughout the city. Um, I don't think it's failed. I do think, however, it's a charade. And by that, I mean, it's a charade to the many members of the community who believe that when they wanna go protest at the mayor's house with 300 other people, that is because they believe the mayor actually has some authority to tell the police chief what to do with the department. And you know, we've done survey work on this before. People think I already have this power or whoever is gonna hold my office already has this power. They assume that's the case in every big city that the mayor actually has the power. And so the point is, is that I believe we're not, failing anyone. I think we are misleading them enormously by not doing anything that actually aligns authority with accountability. That is, they expect their elected officials, particularly their mayor, is going to be accountable and authority should align with accountability or it is essentially a charade. And I can't tell you how many hundreds, if not thousands of messages I received over the last several weeks that are expressed intention with, with all the best intentions from members of the public who simply expect that it will be my direction and it will be done. And of course, they believe that about whoever holds this seat and they're wrong. And they're wrong for reasons they don't understand. And I don't have the time to tell everybody, no, Charter Section 411 says you should go talk to all these people. They should reasonably expect I will be responsive. Whoever holds this seat will be responsive to them. And so uh, that's why I'm supporting uh, the memoranda that were submitted by Vice Mayor Jones and, uh, and Council Member Jimenez. So with that, let's vote. Tony, oh, I think we just take Ma it all. Mayor, were, were you going to accept uh, Council Member Davis's, um, or uh, actually uh, Vice Mayor, accept uh, Council Member Davis's addition to include uh, the mayor? I am because um, Council Member Perala said that would be the nice thing to do. So 
That's what got, <laughs> that's what got me. Okay. Yeah. All right. He knows how to he knows how to use all the right words. All right. Darn it! I, I I'm gonna learn from him. All right. <laughs> On the motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. That passes unanimously. Thank you. Uh, on to the uh, public comment open forum. Uh, the person with the phone number ending 1367. We actually have public's the PIS FIS work plan and the smart cities work. Oh, forgive me. I just skipped right ahead. All right. We're not going there just yet. Reel it back. Here we go. Uh, item 4, H4. Do we have a motion? Move approval. Second. Okay. Is there. Um, all right, we have two folks uh, in the community who'd like to speak. Let me just ask them. Uh, the person with the phone number ending 4963, do you wish to speak specifically on the Public Safety Finance Strategic Support Committee work plan changes? No, I raised for open forum. Okay, and Blair? Yeah, I would like to speak on this item. Uh, can you okay. hear me? Before you do, I'm just going to ask Vice Mayor Jones to take over the meeting. I have an urgent call I need to take right now. Thank you very much. All right. Okay. Uh, hello. Uh, I can go forward? Yes. Go ahead, Blair. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you that uh, you're, it seems you seem to be saying that you're going to start to have uh, committee meetings in August. Uh, thank you. Uh, it, we'll, we'll be doing some regular things again. And uh, Hopefully we can uh, meet in, in council chambers again soon. And to uh, you know, say again what I, what I tried to say on the last item, uh, a thank you to the mayor for his item seven on his nine principles of how to talk with the police at this time, how to work with the police. Uh, it's, it, he wants to amend the charter amendment so the mayor has power uh, to work with the police more and have decision-making power over the police authority more. And for our elected officials to have that power over our police department, I think that is just vital. I think that's like, you know, the, well, that is a process that should never be given up in our country's history, in our past and in our future. So, um, you know, from there, you're dealing with other questions uh, with with the mayor uh with the what the power of the mayor right now and i thank you for a really honest good debate i'm i'm for slowing it up and hopefully maybe it's through the piss fist committee that uh is it is that a place to talk about uh you know what can be you know a more slowed process to to think about it and talk things through with the public more and uh, i hope you can just make those kind of uh decision making at the uh, june 30th council meeting on this subject thank you Thank you. Um, bringing it back. None of my colleagues uh, want to comment, so uh, let's get a motion and to approve. Second. Thank Can you. I get a second? Second. All right. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes. Okay, on to um, Smart Cities and Service Improvement Committee. I'll move approval of the work plan. Okay. Second. Second, and uh, Blair? Hi, thank you. Uh, for the Smart Cities uh, work plan, uh, thank you the same. You know, I, I hope we can have uh, meetings act at actual council chambers this, this fall. That might not be the case, but at least we can have committee meetings, which is uh, which will be really nice. And uh, thank you very much. It's nice to be told ahead of time what to expect, <laughs> you know, for the, for the following months. And uh, I like to be able to work that way. So thank you. And again, uh, my official feelings and opinion is to have the uh, the the November ballot issue. Uh, for June 30th to be put off uh, until a later date, until we have public discussion on uh, mayor power. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that's, uh... all right, so it's been moved and seconded. Can uh, all in favor say aye? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion passes. On to open forum. 
Let's see. Blair Beekman. Hi, thank you very much. This was a very intense uh, rules in open government today. Thank you. Um, to mention the uh, downtown improvement ideas, I forgot to mention when everybody was there earlier, there's the, the tree issue on the Post Street alleyway. And I mentioned it a few times, you know, they're debating to cut down all the trees for safety reasons. There's, there is safety concerns. Uh, they want to replant uh, maple trees and a two, two forms of East Coast uh, North American maple trees of some sort of deciduous trees. I, I, it's a very decent idea, but I, I'm wondering if, you know, if there's other suggestions for the trees that people want to add that to the SJDA and to the city arborist to, to do that. Uh, you know, I, African, I, African trees, you know, for the jazz festival in the summer and Asian trees, which is what currently is there. Uh, you know, I, that has a different set of ambience that uh, to, be, to think about, and uh, I hope uh, good decisions can happen for all of us. Um, and to mention the equity idea one more time, uh, to try to, you know, this will be an issue to always be talked about. It really gives a person, you know, who is alone, <laughs> like myself, you know, it gives a per a feelings and, and, and power in how to ask questions of yourselves. You know, I, I think it's going to be a great, great tool. And I thank you. What I tried to say before, you have an issue in there about uh, digital inclusion and, digi and bridging the digital divide. I think you have to take that issue out of there to give it the, my word of the day is uh, eternal, you know, to give it that sense of eternalness about how a process can be, about the, how the equity process can be. Because the, uh, you know, the digital inclusion questions, you know, there's serious health and safety concerns, and it's an experimental process with those questions. And, you know, we're experimenting on our low-income communities again. So I think you have to be very mindful of that sort of thinking. I don't think it should make the equity list. Thank you. Thank you, Blair. Number that ends with 4963. Hi, Martha O'Connell. Well, it's been a long rules meeting, guys, and this is a good segue into my comment, and I'm sorry that Sam isn't, isn't there. Um, I really wish that people, that they call in many times during a meeting and they go, can you hear me? And I sit there with my teeth on edge. I, I wish there was some way that we could educate these folks to just start speaking. Because if, if Sam can't hear you guys, he's going to tell you. And the council meetings drag on because we go through this, can you hear me, can you hear me thing. So I don't know if maybe the clerk could put instructions on, on online about this, uh, maybe in, in, in capital letters, bolded or something, because I think it would really speed up the meeting if people would stop saying, especially after they've talked 10 times during a meeting, can you hear me? So thank you very much, and I'll be listening on Tuesday, and hopefully we won't have 100 people saying, can you hear me? Thank you. Thank you, Martha. Uh, number ending in... One, three, six, seven. Yes, thank you, uh, Vice Mayor Jones. Um, I love hearing you actually speak and talk about what you believe is an immediate need. You know, sometimes we need radical change, but as long as the voters are allowed to vote on whether we have a strong mayor or not, according to the Board of Fair Politics and Practices, and um, the public discusses that uh, particular item, I think then you'll have um, some discussion from the public as to whether or not they really want that. When Mayor Licardo talked about people picketing in front of his home, it wasn't because they were picketing because they, they know that he can or can't do something. It's the fact that he is a symbol of what can or can't be done, not the fact that he has the power to change things. But um, as long as you put it on a ballot, and you've mentioned this before, you said let the voters decide. I think that's the fair and equitable way to go. Thank you. Thank you. Um, number ending in 5140. I think then you'll have um, some discussion from the public as to whether or not they really want that. And Mayor Ricardo. Uh, I think we lost. 
Uh, yeah, they were giving feedback, so I'll go back to them and see if we can uh, get them on again. Okay. Can you um can you start from the beginning? Uh, we were getting feedback. That's yeah. Yeah, Vice Mayor, I don't think anyone's actually on the line there. Um, that sound we're hearing is the live feed playing in, in the background of uh, their phone. Okay. Yeah. So that was the last uh, speaker. So meeting is adjourned. Thank you.